excuse me, a call to order the January 27th, 2020 meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, thanks to the good folks at ACMI for recording us, inviting us, and making available to people who can't be here this evening. Uh, first on our agenda is a continued public hearing for uh, special permit docket 3602, an application by James F. Dory for 1211 Mass Ave Realty Trust. As I said before uh, <clears throat> we opened the meeting, there is a sign-up sheet. Yeah, there is a sign-up sheet in the back of the room if you wish to speak during the public comment portion. Uh, please sign up back there. I expect that there will be a lot of people wishing to make comments, ask questions this evening, and that will keep things that will keep things moving a little faster <clears throat> as we get through the, the evening. We do have a lot of business to discuss tonight, and I do want to make sure that everyone has a chance to, to say their piece and be heard on this. Uh, so with that, I will open the continued hearing. We have the proponent, his architect, and his attorney here this evening. So if you three could come up, introduce yourselves, uh, and we'll hand it over to, to you all to walk us through what's changed since July. And uh, I'll hand over the microphone to be heard. Where do you want us to stay? Uh, Wherever. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Mary Lynn Stanley O'Connor. I represent the proponent on this project. Uh, with me is Mr. Doherty and Gregory McIntosh, the architect. Um, first, I want to thank the board and the members and the planning department for all of their uh, review and assistance over the past several months on this project. I thought it made sense for the architect to review the changes um, for the public and for the board, if that's acceptable. Yes, Hello, I'm Greg McIntosh from Lincoln Architects. I want to thank you for the opportunity to present uh, the uh, updates to the project. Um, and with that, we can get right into it. I'm going to need a little more slack here. Please just move a little bit closer. I'll just move a little closer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank was the existing condition site plan, uh, noting the vehicles that are all in front and the uh, facilities that are in place now with the surrounding planting and the surrounding buildings. This is the updated uh, survey to drawing with the new building superimposed into it. Uh, one of the most noteworthy changes are the uh, difference in the curb cuts that are there now. There are two curb cuts that are on site now, and we propose on basically maintaining the same amount, slightly shifting it to get vehicles off of Mass Ave and onto the site itself for a drop-off for both the restaurant and the hotel portion. Uh, there are some other changes with building has been set back. We have relocated the trash containment area that is enclosed toward the back of the site. Uh, based off the previous discussions that we have had with your organization. Uh, based off of previous comments, we have updated the cladding of the building to be more indigenous to the area and the types of buildings that are there now. We've gone to a brick and a cast stone with a cementitious panel system for the projecting bays in the building noticing that the uh, upper floor is set back, and then with a more residential feel to the clapboard back there. Based off of previous discussions, Jim, do you mind holding this for a second? There was a request to uh, view the types of uh, cladding that were occurring on the project. The lowest level is going to have a limestone field type of cast stone, which is similar to this right here, which you may want to point it to the camera as well. 
and that is this product that you see in the shadow down here. The type of brick being used on the project is this material here. Uh, it's kind of a cut brick, uh, it's a pretty regular shape. We plan on going with a very light mortar to help lighting it up and to keep it like a very consistent type of product. That will accent with the lighter shades, not quite totally white, but a lighter shade all the way um, with a little mute into it. And then there's a very light gray for the cladding on the rear to kind of make it neutral. Uh, the building is stepped back. We've articulated the railings and integrated some of the other features right in there. And we've cut this other portion of the building on the upper floor back as well. Notice the bike racks that are in front right down here. Also, a very important feature of this is we have softened and lowered uh, the retaining feature, the retaining wall feature right here, making the space a lot more inviting. This is a little bit more of a bird's eye view of the same. Again, the bicycles are sort of stored right here. It's only one of the two bicycle storage areas. The curb cuts are here, driving through there. It's a nice gathering area with a good feel there with using uh, landscaping to isolate the eating area. Uh, it's important to note that all the paving that you see here in the walking surfaces is all going to be pervious paving. Um, this will allow for a lot of the water to just drain right through it. And, uh, not create a runoff issue in the community. This is a image, an actual photograph with the building superimposed into it down by the lender bank to see the context of how the building fits in. Um, does not appear to be dominating it in uh, any way uh, based off of the surrounding existing to the main construction. And looking at the other buildings that are obviously ascending in grade, but are obviously a lot higher than that. Excuse me, could you turn that a bit so we can see it? Thank you. Kind of need everyone to see it too, so I'm trying to figure out a good way to do this. <laughs> you have copies, right? Lord? I do. Yeah, we also need to see the, the drawings. Yeah. So, can you? I can see. Okay. Let me know if you need me to move around. I'd be happy to do it. Thank you. This next image is from the opposite end of the road. There's an apartment building right up here. Um, this is obviously a brick building, and that's we're tying in with it. But notice the scale and the massing of that, and it's at least in keeping. If not, this is actually going to be lower than the ground and not other facility that's right up the road. Um, so the context of it is trying to be as harmonious as absolutely possible. Uh, this is the planting plan. The area that you see in the light green shaded is the zone of the pervious paving. We also have the buffer space back in here with a uh, rain garden in that area. The trash removal area is right here, it will be fully enclosed. Uh, we have uh, bicycle parking in here and within the limits of the building as well. There's an indoor storage facility. And moving along, the indoor bicycle storage facility is right here and it's within keeping of the elevator and easy access for the people to use. Um, it's within that zone of the building. It was previously on the opposite side, but it's a lot more user friendly to have it over here. And it is actually increased in size as well, giving it far more capacity. Uh, this being the hotel portion, lobby, this being the uh, restaurant portion. The upper floors uh, contain approximately 22 hotel rooms. This would be over two floors with upper story uh, set back, uh, but they're slightly more extended state versions. They're a little bit larger than the rooms below to uh, accommodate people that might be there for longer than a day or so. 
the building facade, again, there's the cast stone here. There is the uh, entrance to the hotel. By the way, the hotel entrance does have a covered portico share going around that cut in driveway um, with a flat skylight ceiling on it um, so that people can see through it. I mean, it's natural light through it, but also it's not taking up any more presence on the building facade. Um, this upper portion of the building has been set back. Uh, this is the rear elevation of the building. We plan on maintaining and accentuating as much of the buffer as humanly possible. Uh, the existing to remain large growth trees back there um, takes up about that much volume. Um, the access onto this area here, that slope, is approximately uh, it's under a 1 in 20 slope, which is somewhat standard for a ramp in a parking garage building. The visual cladding materials, again, as you reach the corner going down Clark Street, and, and the retaining wall has been reduced in size um, using landscaping as the buffer there. Um, the brick is going to tie into some of the other surrounding buildings on Massachusetts Avenue. And then we have a whole myriad of solar studies Shade, shade studies. Uh, it starts off with the existing conditions that are there now. And it's important to note that we have confirmed um, these documents produced do factor in the contour of the grading. So that's not a flat image. Um, I can produce a SketchUp model that shows that for anyone that would care to look at it. But if you'll notice, the impact that the existing uh, foliage has is in 90% of the cases greater than any of the buildings, whether it be new or existing. As you can see, this is a proposed building and the growth that is there that will be remaining is still there and there are approximately, well there are definitely two buildings in the area that have solar arrays on their roofs, none of which will be affected by any of the shadows cast on this building. As you can see, uh, you can see the foliage lining right here guys, it's having a greater effect on the building. And obviously, nighttime is what it is. So that is, in a nutshell, where we are with the updates to the plans based off of the comments from the previous time. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. Okay. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so we're moving into to board questions. We did get an email from uh, a resident earlier this week, and because it involved technical questions for you, I asked the department to prepare answers to that. So I'm going to turn it over to Erin, if you could hand her the microphone. Sure. We'll walk through that. There are questions that many people on the board share. Uh, so thank you to Don Seltzer for providing that. And we'll uh, still give you a chance to speak later, but I'll let Erin respond to your email. Yeah. 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 No. Um, from Mr. Seltzer on Friday. Um, the correspondence will be posted at a later date, but I passed it out to the ARV members and they also received it through a forward this afternoon. Um, so just a, a couple of things to uh, respond and I'll try and be quick. Um, the proposal has been and will continue to be evaluated as a mixed use structure that is compliant with the zoning bylaw. Um, in some cases, strictly residential requirements have been suggested to apply to this proposal, but they're not applicable because the mixed use structure is um, not being evaluated as a principally residential structure. Um, so in response to some of the assertions, um, a detailed site plan um, that includes topographical information across the property would be very helpful for the ARB and the staff to evaluate this project. Um, that has been requested in the past um, and ha has yet been provided by the applicant. Um, so to get into some of the items that were uh, uh, noted by Mr. Seltzer, um, 
in, in terms of the computation of the gross floor area um, related to the bonus provisions in section 536. Um, the total lot area is 14,030 square feet. Um, section 536 outlines the bonus provisions and requires that a district have an FAR of 1.2 or greater and that non-residential non uses do not have a minimum lot area requirement. Um, the project meets both of these requirements, having a 1.5 FAR and being a non-residential mixed-use structure, it can access the bonus provisions. However, I also calculated the FAR. Um, the FAR that I calculated is also greater than the 1.67 that was requested in the initial submittal by the applicant. So as has been previously requested by the applicant, um, I think a clear accounting of the FAR um, and the open space, which is the bonus provision that he has indicated that he'd like to take advantage of, um, is desired in order to fully assess this proposal. Um, moving on to elevations, um, as I noted in the start of my comments, a detailed site plan would help illuminate the topographic condition of this site. Um, this has been requested. Um, without a clear understanding of the topographic condition of the property, the ARB and the staff cannot assess the driveway slope or liaise with our town colleagues in assessing the slope or any grading that may be necessary on the property. It should be noted that the zoning bylaw sets forth the driveway slope requirement for single family, two family duplex, and three family dwellings of 15%, but does not um, set forth the driveway slope for other types of proposals. <coughs> Um, similarly, for the Mass Ave elevation, understanding the topographic condition of the property would help the ARB and assess the elevation in particular, any grading necessary or where the foundation may be visible. Um, further, building height is defined in the zoning bylaw as the vertical distance of the highest point of the roof above the average grade of the curb line abutting the property. It is unclear whether the architect has this required information in order to accurately measure the building height. Um, again, understanding the topography of the site would assist in making this determination. Regarding the Clark Street setback, um, section 538 of the zoning bylaw does state a corner lot shall have the minimum street yards with depths which shall be the same as the required front yard depths for the adjoining lots. But further in section 5316, the zoning bylaw allows in cases subject to section 3.4 environmental design review, the ARB in evaluating the proposal may grant a special permit to adjust the required setbacks set forth elsewhere in this bylaw to account for specific conditions unique to the proposal. So that is something that um, you all can make a determination on. On the upper story setback, um, the applicant has presented in the past that he recognizes the proposal does not meet the strict interpretation of section 5317 which requires a step back of 7.5 feet beginning at the third story if the structure is more than three stories, which this one is. Um, the applicant has suggested that since the building is stepped back at the first floor, then projects out at the second and third, and steps back again at the fourth floor, that is generally consistent with the goal of this provision. And the ARB can make a determination on whether that is accurate. Um, but this, this does not address the applicability of the step back to the Clark Street elevation, which is an adjoining street to the property. For usable open space, um, section 5321D requires that for mixed uses and any permitted residential use not specifically identified in the tables in section 552, those are the density and dimensional tables for the business districts, the minimum open space requirements, which are computed from the residential floor area, shall be 10% landscaped and 20% usable in the B1, B2, B2A, B3, and B4 districts, and 15% usable in the B5 district. As there's no residential floor area in this mixed use structure, um, there is not a usable open space requirement. And then finally, uh, regarding the um, uses of the B2 district. Um, the use is a mixed use structure, which is allowed in the B2 and B4 districts. Um, mixed use on lots less than 20,000 square feet, which is the case here, um, can be a maximum of four stories in both zoning districts. Um, so that is our response to um, the email that you received. Um, if you have further questions, or if others have questions about it, I'm happy to um, answer them. Thank you. 
answer. Right. So <clears throat> thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Don, for bringing those matters to our attention. Again, I'll let you speak during public hearing. Um, so I'm going to start with Ken. Just go down the line here. With questions from members of the board before we turn it over to public. Uh, thank you, Don, for your uh, questions you submitted in earlier. I also took a look at the, uh, the zoning issues here, and uh, I agree that uh, we do need some uh, topographics to understand slope and building height. And um, as far as the clock street setback, I think I'm fine with that setback because it's a corner lot and behind it, there's another building right directly behind it, which is also a corner lot. And both buildings um, do not, when, when it's a corner lot, it's the setback is the front elevation on both sides. So the building behind it is also the setback of both sides. So if you look at taking the average of what's adjacent to it, that's what your setback is. There is an exception for that. I think we're fine with that. But I prefer if you just did that calculation and asked that when you uh, resubmit this uh, site plan, that you do include uh, buildings adjacent. This is just not the site plan and the property line itself, but all the buildings around it, so we can see and understand a little better, and there'll probably be a little less confusion there. Sure. Um, as far as the upper story setback, um, I also uh, uh, agree with, uh, with you guys saying that the setback is zero on, on, the, on the front yard uh, front yard setback. If you bring it up three stories, then bring it back, that's seven and a half feet. Uh, that is your envelope you have to uh, stay away from, and I believe you guys do. Because the building's already set back already. Just because it's set back, you don't have to set back anymore because you already meet, met the setback requirements for above. That's my understanding, okay? Uh, and then uh, I will move off some of this other stuff here. Um, I want to thank you for doing the two um, renderings that we had asked for before, uh, showing its context with the surrounding buildings. I think that gives us a much better understanding of how this building fits with the adjacent neighbors. And I'm especially um, like the one that's coming down from Lexington, mm -hmm. heading toward uh, into Arlington, that that side elevation and that corner is really that is an important corner because of that bend in the road. And the fact that you're elevated up high and coming down to it. So I like the fact you guys address that corner by trying to dress it up a little bit. My concern is and we'll jump around a little bit, but on this elevation here you have you have um, brick and uh, aircraft stone below, and then the rest is just uh, cement board. At the, our, our last meeting, we suggested that that band you have at the podium level could be thicker, just to make it look more balanced. Because right now, if you look at the columns and you look at that band you, go, you have going across there, and what's above it, it doesn't look like it's quite balanced. If you can thicken that band up, it also give you an, uh, an advantage of having the sign that you sit within a sign band there that you're a little more comfortable. I actually did increase it, but maybe it could use a little more. Okay, yes. I, it, I added six inches to it. Okay, I, I think you could get a, be a little more bolder, you know. And I'll let Rachel uh, also. Go into the base? Yeah, that, that, that white band you got right across uh, yeah. the colonnade there. It looks. I mean, it looks like almost the same size as the columns. I'm wondering if raising it up to the base of the projections. That's wrong system. I'm going to knock my architect and let you. All right. I'm just <laughs> commenting on the fact that it looks, uh, you know, a little flimsy. Okay. Um, the other comment I had was I like the fact you took the trash and put it way back. And away from away from public streets. That's very nice. Thank you. Um, if when you do this topo, mm -hmm. if you can also include a building section, 
Sure. It would help a lot on understanding what the height of the rear parking lot is and the sidewalk in front along Mass Ave. Okay. And so it, it tells you how high the building's sticking up, how, build, how, how low the building's sticking down, and, and what the grading is. All right, because right now I'm assuming the site, uh, the site plan in the back, everything is draining toward your landscape buffer area. No, it's, it's, it's sloping back toward the building? It's going to slope toward the middle of the parking lot where we will be engaging a contact system, and that's something I need to review with the civil engineer. There will be all surface water and roof drainage that will be handled on site. Okay, that's something that we, we would like to sure. um, have a better understanding of, just so that you know it's not being pushed off to the side, it's not being pushed off to uh, right. the next neighbor's yard. And right now, we don't have an indication of where that's going. I thought it was just sloping naturally toward your green, green straight back there, but we got to contain it. Okay, the sloping doesn't work well that way. Right. I know. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna sort of leave it like that for now, and let, give everybody else a chance to comment, and I might come back to sure. all comments. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Go ahead, David. Uh, well, thank you for listening to so many of the board's comments from from the last time we were together. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, I do like the look of the building uh, significantly more now. Uh, I appreciate uh, that you have moved the, um, the drop-off area uh, out of the public way and onto the property. Um, that addresses uh, a number of concerns that I had. Uh, also appreciate moving the bike parking into a much more prominent location, which uh, will uh, incentivize people to use it more. Uh, as well as improving the interior bike parking. Um, I um, did understand in reviewing uh, the latest documents that the, uh, the on-site parking would be entirely handled by uh, valets. Uh, and I, I think that does make sense when you're dealing with a pretty uh, constrained area. Um, I do have some concern that the fact that people can't self-park on the property um, may make it more likely that, that they will seek to park in the surrounding neighborhood rather than use the valet service. Um, and I'm not sure how to avoid that. Um, if you're using the valet service, um, other than making sure to encourage um, hotel guests uh, um, strongly to make use of the valet service. Um, with respect to the restaurant pa patrons, I, I think they're just going to end up parking wherever they, wherever they park. Um, I'm disappointed that we still don't have a detailed traffic analysis um, that uh, looks at how this, uh, this new use um, will affect the operation of uh, Mass Ave and the adjoining intersections. Um, this is a high traffic, uh, very complex intersection uh, and uh, particularly uh, during peak times, I'd like to have a much better understanding of how um, movement in and out of, of the hotel property will affect the operation of, of the intersections. Um, I also... Um, on a different, different topic, uh, do have some concern uh, about how the upper story step back is, is being handled. I, I understand the argument that you're making and I'm, I'm willing to consider it, uh, but at the same time, I'm not sure that we really have the flexibility um, to, uh, 
to think about the building envelope the way your your um, um, describing it to us rather than strictly adhering to the to the uh, to the step back requirement as it's laid out in the bylaw. There's probably some flexibility uh, on that upper floor um, to a limited degree. I do want to point out that we did increase the one dramatically on Park Street uh, from the previous submission. And I appreciate that. Yeah, so we've taken the, a lot of steps to get it in, you know, in a direction that I think that there was some expectation to. Um, is there an opportunity to do a little bit more? Potentially. But it would take some reevaluation of the layout of the Could I just point make one um, observation? Sure. You, I believe, uh, in September just approved the building at 117 Broadway, which is identical in terms of setbacks. Just, just for information purposes, that might be a, a good project to look at. I have a copy of the plan here if you'd like it. Oh, that's okay. We, we can look at that. Just trying to be helpful. I appreciate it. Um, the other thing I, I would like to see, um, and this is perhaps more a question uh, for uh, the staff, um, I, I do have concern. Um, uh, about making sure that um, we have a um, a uh, supportable justification um, for um, the fact that this project straddles two zoning districts with different requirements, okay. um, and to the extent that. Um, we would be permitting a use that on its own is permitted in one zone, but not in the other. Um, I want to make sure that we're on firm ground, um, that, um, that the district that allows that use um, controls here, or barring that, that the fact that both districts allow mixed use um, truly controls, despite the fact that um, one of the uses on its own would not be permitted in one of the zones. Um, and I, I don't feel like we have documented that um, sufficiently at this okay. point. So um, I can ask, I think Doug has um, addressed that in various emails over the course of time, but I can ask him to put together something more formal. Um, I think those were my major comments at this point. Thanks, and uh, thanks for the presentation tonight and the changes made. And thank you to folks who emailed us with concerns about the project ahead of time so we had a chance, and the staff had a chance to look at them. I, I basically agree with what my colleagues said up to this point with, with a couple of exceptions, but let me go to some other places mm -hmm. first. Um, do you have the memo that Jennifer Rate wrote on January 21? Have they gotten that? I think so. OK. I basically agree with her critiques and what's missing. So I won't go yeah. into those in detail. I do have a couple other concerns about traffic and parking. It's, it's not clear to me whether the restaurant patrons will be able to park in back of the building in the parking lot or not. What is the answer to that? Well, uh, under the mixed use bylaw, they're, uh, they're, he's proposing 28 spaces. Um, 56 are required by the two uses. You have the ability to reduce it down to 25%. The reality is that the restaurant people will probably not park in the hotel parking lot. I mean, I think it makes sense they not, because right. if we're going to reduce the amount of parking, it needs to be for 
the people who are using it as lodging and not people Correct. who are using it for the restaurant side. So I think we would want something specifically indicating that the restaurant patrons would not be using the parking lot, the parking in back. I guess to elaborate on that and back to David's point as well, the valet is free. So in other words, you come up there as a guest, you don't really have an option. We're going to park your car. Um, hotel in Porter Square, for example, they, they've cited 40% uh, of, of their patrons come via rideshare. This is not even getting into other, other modes as well. Um, Mary has further information to elaborate, but um, our intent is for the um, parking to be solely for um, the, the lodging guests, as you say. The, just on the spaces we provided, and I can give you a spreadsheet on it, but if you run the 50 at either 70 or 80 percent, which was part of the debate when we were last here, of what that number would be, the spaces we have would cover both of those numbers, assuming all of those percentages came. In other words, 70% or 80% of the patrons came, all of them would be coming via vehicle. We're providing that works out to those numbers, falls in those numbers. Now, in addition, we're in the um, drive area in between, because it's going to be 100% valet, there's additional space for seven to 14 vehicles. If you then add those in, you'd have sufficient parking for everyone staying there, assuming everybody came in their car and they all had one vehicle. Wait, where's the extra seven to 14 spaces? If, I if you stack parking. If you stack parking. Um, if I'm oh, okay. Got it, got it. This, this board. I, I'm not saying it's a good so, answer. Um, this board, if some of the members want it, may remember I had represented the hotel in East Arlington and we had presented a stack parking plan um, uh, that was approved. Uh, provided it was valet um, a use. Um, I can tell you that the hotel in East Arlington is 120 um, units, hotel rooms. I happened to stay there three months uh, a couple of years ago during peak season. There were no more than eight or ten cars in that garage. Uh, with the advent of ride sharing and Uber, <coughs> it's amazing to me that most of the people are coming via that type of transportation or public transportation. Okay. So we could give you that commitment, I guess, was a long way of getting to you. I, th I think that question. would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem. That's fine. To have that. Yep. And another question is where are the employees, staff mm -hmm. going to be parking? Mm -hmm. Clearly not in that lot. So. Not, not on the lot. We are going to see if uh, Sunrise Up the Heights, which they have an agreement, I think, as you know, um, for employee parking, we're going to access there. And we've also um, still working on a situation with people in the, that area. I've had people express interest in it. I have somebody who's going to commit to the bus, which if I could just digress for a moment. The other part that's kind of like, you know, goes both ways. If people come by bus, which we believe that to be a, a big attraction, this whole parking issue is a non-issue. Conversely, it's everybody comes via vehicles or ride share and those things then you don't have a bus. So in, in a, one other thing that came about was buses seem to get plural at the, at the last meeting. I just want to assure you that the hotel couldn't handle more than a bus. So from that standpoint, um, where we're looking to take care of those people is we know the town of Arlington has two locations we've already looked at for, for the employees, one being at the skating rink, which is right down Ryder Street, and the other is up at the Audison. In addition, as I say, we are talking to some private uh, people and um, for parking as well. So um, we don't we don't feel that the uh, employee issue will be a major uh, inconvenience. We had in our traffic demand study as well, where we have other methods based on your criteria that we we agreed to do, including. Uh, MBTA reimbursements and things like that in that plan as well. So um, we're, we're clearly trying to address it as, as best we can. What's the maximum number of staff who will be at the hotel and restaurant at any one time? So the hotel basically you're going to have two full-time people if you figure basically 24-7. So you're going to have two people working at the hotel if you, if you figure out how that would go, okay, on a full-time 
full-time equivalency if you I mean I'm sure you've all run those type of numbers the restaurant itself probably realistically you're talking about anywhere from six to ten people you know maybe eight people depending and that would probably only be on your Friday Saturday maybe Thursday night type thing Except the hotel's going to have people cleaning the rooms, so it has to be more than two people there. Again, that's what I'm saying. At, at any given time, you're basically going to have a valet, okay, and then you're going to have the hotel concierge manager, if you will. It's, again, it's a 50-unit hotel we're talking about here. So maybe you're talking about three when you have the house cleaner come in. If you want to throw another one, four. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is there's not going to be a buffer of of, of employees there. It's not as if it's an office building or, or some high use type thing like that. Yeah, the bus was my next question about where, because you had spoken last time about potentially having tours Correct. using the place. So I think we would want to know yep. what arrangements have been made. I have, the tour I bus. have something. Again, I, you know, I can tell you that I have an agreement with someone that we're going to be memorializing. And it's it's in it's in the area. It's yeah, very, so very we'll close. see that <coughs> when, when you come back. Yeah. Um, what you've done with the sidewalk, is, as opposed to the bump out or the bump in, mm -hmm. seems very good. It's hard for me to tell how wide is the sidewalk going to be on that arc. It's uh, the sidewalk around the arc going into the hotel from the street sidewalk. Yeah, the, the arc that's been... It's five feet. It's five feet wide? Mm -hmm. There could be some variation in that too. But and will the tour bus be able to fit in there under the... Uh, it is compliant with the DOT standards. Mm -hmm. Yes. That means the tour bus yeah. will indeed fit under there. I had a question about the shadows and the two houses with solar arrays. I understand that the shadows won't hit one of the houses with the solar arrays, but it will affect the other house with the solar array, the one at um, early afternoon shadow on winter solstice will affect 18 Pierce Street. So the um, solar panels that you're speaking of are actually facing east. Well, that's what I was asking. Right, and so the building is west of it. Mm -hmm. So that shadow won't hit those panels. And the one at 24 Clark Street is just beyond the limit of it. Right. So the shadows will hit the building, but not, Correct. not the solar. Correct. Right. Okay. I just want to echo David's thought about the step backs um, one story higher than it appears the bylaw requires. Um, and I, I will go take a look at 117 Broadway. I'm not familiar with it and discuss this with the staff. But I looked through the bylaws for something that gives us the authority to waive or vary where the step back goes, and I can't find it. Um, there are lots of places in the bylaws that give the redevelopment board the authority to change height, change dimension, <coughs> setbacks, but I can't find one place that gives us the authority to change the step back from the third floor to the fourth floor. And I understand your rationale, and it certainly makes sense, but it has to be done, in my opinion, consistent with the bylaw. And I'll talk to the staff about that some more, because at the moment, I can't find, I can't find it. And without finding it, I don't think I could agree. But again, I will talk to staff. I'll go take a look at 117 Broadway. But I like your rationale, but I don't see it fitting in with the bylaw. Thank you, Jane. Go ahead, Rachel. Thank you, thank you, Rob. I, I um, appreciate the the changes that you've made um, and 
and responsiveness to the to the feedback that we gave you at the at the last meeting. Um, I had a couple of questions. The first being on the on the site plan, on the new courtyard to the right of the entrance. What is that in, intended to be used for? I think there's some pervious paving. Um, to the right of the front entrance? Correct. It's, um, it's actually, it's about 500 feet, and that is where the public space we're proposing for the bonus uh, bonus area is based on. Now the bonus area calls for uh, basically 10 to 1 ratio yep. there. The area is closer to like 500 feet. I think it's actually even larger than that. It is, Jim. Yes. It's, it's north of 700. That's what I thought. We're proposing to, even though we can't benefit by it, because we can only cap that, we cap that 10% for that, that part. We, our intent was to do an easement on a much larger spot, because if you think about it, what is really 200 square feet, if you're gonna have a reading, say, or a presentation, or the select tones, or you know any of that type of thing, you need a bigger area, so our intent was to use that area for that. So it will be programmed in, in some way, which is why you found that the pervious paving as opposed to a landscaping Correct. in that area. And to that point, we're not opposed, other than for the mm -hmm. reason you just stated, Right. <laughs> we're not opposed to making that entire green area you see there, it can be grass. Just as easy, it's just to the point you made that sure. if it's, it's usable, it, you know, so. Okay. Um, on the, um, the, oh, I'll just turn this around. This elevation here. <laughs> Clark Street, sure. But yes, the Clark Street elevation. I, I had a question for you. Um, I'm just looking at that and I'm struggling a little bit and I think Kim started to bring this up with the balance in the building on the on the front facade. And I think all of the moves that you've made so far are a positive step in the, in the, in the right direction. Um, one of the challenges I'm having is the scale of the projections on the second and third <coughs> Floor, which then form the parapet of the of the balcony that you have on the, on sure. the fourth floor. I think that the scale you have on the rear of the building um, makes a lot more sense ar architecturally. And um, what, one of the challenges too is that you have that field of brick on the Clark Street facade. You really you you see it in kind of slivers on the on the front of the building, and it doesn't really the the proportion of the these, uh, this projection on the front with the parapet included as part of the, um, the, the fiber cement board cladding seems a bit out of scale. So I, I would just ask that perhaps you look at, perhaps there's a brick band that runs across and those, and perhaps that becomes the parapet rather than this extending okay. above. Um, it, it just feels, the, the scale is, uh, we could look to feels a little out of proportion. We could certainly look at that. We could also look at just doing rails across the front field and reducing the parapet. Sure, I, I think it's the scale, which is again part of the issue that, right. that Ken was was speaking about, and I think that that will help as well with the variation of the material. The the the, uh, uh, the motive be, the motive behind the parapet mm -hmm. was to actually lend a little buffer and more privacy to that upper level. Sure. Uh, yeah, but there are a lot of ways to do it. Sure, absolutely. And so that's certainly worth taking a look at when you're, you're suggesting. And that way it would be a little bit more in keeping with the Clark Street side and then it would turn around the corner. And you, you'd see it because, you, know, you know, to your point, uh, you do see both at the same time. Right, and that's you a very so, prominent corner. Yeah, right. We could certainly take a look at that. Okay, yep, just looking for a way to marry those two a little bit right. more. Um, I also noticed on that same on the Park Street elevation that we still have the, the louvers on the on the side of, of those um, are those louvers. They're on they the, were on the front. Now they're on. They're the on side. the sides of each one. A again, it's it's um, not something that I, I love seeing again as as you're driving down Mass Ave and this is the um, you know the such a prominent corner and the, the view that you're going to have. So um, I, I just ask that that be, you take a look at that as well. That is actually, and I'm sure you're aware of this, is dependent on an engineer solution. Sure. But what I'm looking at now is probably a worst case scenario when that actual VTAC unit gets selected and engineered. Right. The louver size will be at that point 
we'll find everywhere we can to minimize it and blend it in so it's not a quote prominent feature on the building. Sure, and I think in order for us to get to an approvable elevation, we want to, to to try and find what what a solution is that that will work for for the building sure. as well as you know it, it, yeah. a range of significantly smaller than what we're so right what, now. what would probably entail is just a preliminary specification on the VTAC unit. And then at that point, we could leave us to a little or so. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, as we look at the rear elevation that's facing the um, the uh, the residents mm -hmm. uh, behind, mm -hmm. um, looking, I ask if we could look at the the band of windows that's running along the the fourth floor. I believe it's along the corridor. Yeah. The, those. And again, I think that um, I mentioned this in our in our last review too that they they don't really feel like they that they have any proportional relationship to to the um, to the cadence of, of of rhythm you have going on below. Um, so I I'd ask that it, I'm assuming that those are in the corridor. Well, they're they're it's basically a floor plan driven condition based off of where the entrances to the rooms are. Um, what you're saying is true, and they can be moved to the left or to the right in order to make it more appealing on the exterior. That's certainly not a significant issue. The main purpose of those windows is just to provide general natural light to the corridor. Sure. Um, it would have been really nice to have it as you walk out of the room to see it, but in the hierarchy of the importance of things, we can certainly move them around uh, to make the exterior quote more appealing in that type of regard if you right, wish. Right. I mean I, I might even, you know, pair them and it, it just it doesn't really have anything to and again if we're trying to marry this in a more singular architectural style, sure. I I'd ask that we take a look at that. Um, and uh, again I think most of my colleagues have, have addressed parking and some of the other um, some of the other items. Where are you in in plan proposing right now the main entrance to your restaurant? Is that on the front facade or on the corner nope. on Clark it's Street? Just, it's just to the left of where the hotel is. Right okay. here versus right here. Right. Hotel. Yep. Uh, restaurant entrance. It's important to note that these here are bifolding uh, openings that you can Which is great. Converse yeah. in and out of and the hotel has the exact same <coughs> ones too. Right so that they can enjoy the outdoor area just as much. Great, I think that's a nice feature. My, my comment was more going to be on the, the signage. Um, I believe that you have a restaurant sign on the uh, Clark Street um, sign, Correct. more or less sign, sign band there. And um, you know, I, I think that as you look at, at this in, uh, in the rendering that you have coming down that corner. Sure. You know, it, it makes sense to, to think about the signage for the restaurant within the... I think it's the next one. No, it's, it's <coughs> You see the sign band here? Right. And the other one's actually obscured by the tree. Right. That's an existing to remain. Sure. So. I just don't know that it makes sense to sign the restaurant on, on Clark Street, specifically since you don't want people driving down Clark Street and that that parking area is not going to be, you know. Again, I think anything we can do to keep people who are visiting from um, flooding that that neighborhood sure. would, would be a step in the, the right direction, probably for the for the residents. So I would I would just ask that you take a look at the signage to remain on on Mass Ave. Uh, and again, if there was anything that was going to be on the corner, I would think that it would be a more prominent um, sign for the hotel property itself. Okay. Thank you. Gene's question about the neighbor's solar arrays reminded me. I think uh, I had uh, maybe been the one who asked for uh, the shadow studies to show both the existing condition and the, the proposed condition. And uh, so I, I very much appreciate that you provided that. Um, uh, I also. Uh, appreciate that uh, that you mentioned that those shadow studies do take the topography into account uh, because I, I will say I was surprised and I guess pleasantly surprised by how little impact uh, on, on the shadows uh, 
on the neighboring structures uh, this project would have. This has nothing to do with actually approval process. I just have a quick question on uh, the name of the hotel. I just noticed. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm bringing the source of it. I don't know, but I'm bringing the source of it. It's a beautiful place in New York. I used to stay there all the time. Okay, because I just see that there'd it, be some sort of confusion. Just I just noticed that I did not notice it earlier, and um, just looking at it saying Lexington Hotel, it's clearly in Arlington. Uh, just a question. I suggested that the name here be placed there, and let them figure out what the name is going to be. We've had a lot of uh, <laughs> lot of comments, <laughs> um, few uh, even from people very close to me uh, um, who uh, who have made a similar observation. Um, and um, to be honest with you, in many respects, for a lot of those. They're really more of almost a placeholder. Millbrook Tavern, I loved it. I happened to spend a lot of time in Millbrook, literally, when I was a child. Um, but, you know, um, it may not come that way. So we were really trying to create placeholders to get a buy-in on where the actual locations of, of the signage would be. That, that was a scale location. But you weren't alone in your observation. I'm not sure we can no. reject a man. No, we can't reject a special firm. <laughs> no, I acknowledge that. I just. Alex has got a nice ring cold. to it, too, but there's too many monotonies, everything in town, so we missed that one. So I, I'll echo <clears throat> the comments of my colleagues and not get too deep into the weeds here. I do appreciate the work that you've done. Um, I think you can probably appreciate that there's a bit more to go before we're satisfied, uh, both on your end and on the on part of staff to get us there. Um, so thank you, let's, let's keep this moving. Uh, I am gonna open it up to public comment, but I do want you to consider when you might be able to come back uh, <clears throat> as we go through this process. Uh, I prefer not to have a six month wait before the next year. So I'm just getting that there's a lot of work to be done that's it's important that we keep this going. Um, so I am going to open up uh, the floor for public comment now. I have a short list that I'm going to work through. Uh, some people came in late, they probably didn't sign up. Uh, it's all right, raise your hand and I'll get to you once I'm through the list. I'll make that announcement again. Uh, I am going to try to stick to a strict time limit of three minutes. This is outlined in our bylaws just because I think that there probably are people who would like to speak. Uh, I'd ask you to stick to the facts this evening. Stick to what's in front of you. Uh, speculation, conjecture doesn't help anyone. If there are questions you have, that's certainly welcome. Uh, <clears throat> but I think we're all in, in the idea that uh, we'd like to keep this civil, keep the process moving along. Uh, and I know there's a lot of discussion about some things that are out there. We can ask those questions and have that answer. Uh, the board, as, as I've indicated to Mr. Dory, uh, will not be taking a vote on this particular project this evening, um, but we will, and this has been communicated to members of the board before, we will be taking a vote on the special permit waiver. We'll get into that after public comment. Uh, if the public does have questions about that, feel free to ask and we can answer those. Uh, the fee being waived is only the special permit and it's approximately a $2,600 fee. Uh, we'll discuss that separately <coughs> after we're through with uh, public comment. So with that, it's open. Uh, and first on the list, Barbara Thornton, did you want to speak to the hotel or just the warrant yeah. articles? Okay. All right, so the next name on the list is Ann LaRoyer. Uh, for the, the sake of convenience, I know it's not the easiest thing to come up, uh, but the sake of everyone else hearing, I guess, not mm -hmm. convenience. Come on up, uh, I'll hand you the microphone, state your name and address. Uh, the board will take everything under advisement at this time. Uh, we're going to get into a back and forth, but if it's a question that can be easily responded to by the applicant, we'll do so. Thank you. I'm Anne Leroyer. I live at 12 Pier Street, behind the hotel site. Um, I have a lot of questions. I'll try to keep into three minutes, and I'm sure others will cover them. Um, I did want to clarify the B2 zoning issue, which has been brought up. Um, the B2 describes um, currently allowed uses uh, in the zoning, which a hotel is not allowed in a B2. And it also tries to address um, developments that will maintain the character of the neighborhood 
um, which this hotel I don't believe does, um, that the neighborhood is one and two story businesses um, in the B2 surrounding neighborhoods and one and two family residential areas. A, a four story hotel is, is not um, in that character as far as I'm concerned. Um, the second question uh, was about the liquor store that's now been approved at the Nicola site right across Clark Street. Just a question about traffic and other issues that that new use, it's been a vacant use for about four or five years, but with these two new developments happening immediately in our neighborhood, um, I just want the board to think about what multiple implications there could be for parking, uh, traffic, so forth. With, uh, a liquor store right next to a hotel. Um, I would like to see if they could um, do an elevation from the back side, the view from Pierce Street, especially for the two, two or three houses that are immediately behind the hotel. The way I look at the drawings, it, it almost looks like six stories from looking at uh, Pier, from the Pierce Street side. You've got the lower level, the parking, the first floor, three stories of um, where's the, uh, the, the hotels, and then there's the uh, mechanical unit on the roof. So combined, I, I know some of you addressed the issue about height, and you're going to look at that in the site plan and so forth. But um, an elevation looking from the backside would be helpful to give some perspective to how the neighborhood is going to be uh, trying to absorb this this building. Um, I'm concerned about trees. Um, there's, I think that you said that the trees would not be cut down behind the DAB building. Is that correct? When there are a couple of very large trees. We, have, we haven't evaluated it. The one behind the DAB, um, we believe it is. It is I know what it looks it is. like that one there. It's the. Um, it's in the parking lot, I believe. The other one's not on my property. So we won't be this, one is, this one is on the neighbor's property, so, but this one is on the property, and uh, well, help, shoot. okay, well, maybe I can come back later. We'll also take comments by uh, email, uh, uh, Carol and Leo, or Leo McDonald, do you wish to speak? Carol McDonald, I live at 1194 Bath Every morning, I pull out of my driveway. I can't go left toward Appleton Street, Appleton Street because of the school traffic. So, I go left, I take a left down Father Street, I take a left up Pier Street, and then I go up Clark. When you go up Clark, at 7 and 8 o'clock, you have that clear coming from the sun. It's hard to see the cars coming up Mass Ave, and it's also hard to see the cars coming from Low Street. It's a very bad point at that time of day. And plus, the Clark Street is in terrible shape, and who's going to be responsible for paving that? That's me. Okay, thank you. Can I just, can I just mention something? Go ahead. I don't want to get too back and forth right now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think those are all the important concerns. We're, we're, we're in listening phase right now. Uh, Steve Redblack. Good evening, Steve Redblack, 111 in Sunnyside Avenue. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in here when your board was having a joint meeting with the select board. And during the comment, public comment phase of that meeting, I remember a number of people coming up and mentioning Arlington's commercial tax base, how small it was, specifically 5.6%. And if I understood and interpreted their remarks correctly, I kind of got the feeling that they would, uh, you know, they kind of wanted to have a bigger commercial tax base in Arlington. Um, and this is this is a purely commercial development, in a, you know, which would stand to increase our tax base. I mean, there are reasons why our tax, commercial tax base is so small, um, mainly because we don't, you know, we don't make it easy to develop here. Um, and we don't have a habit of welcoming commercial projects like this with open arms. 
I think this one is pretty nice. I really like the way it looks on the street renderings. Um, I, granted, there are some details to work, for, work through, but um, I would like to see it move forward. Um, finally, I'd like to, to just you know point out, you know, just in terms of thinking through different scenarios, um, RB districts allow a single and two-family homes by right. So if this, you know, for some reason, the hotel project were not to work out, I think it's completely conceivable for these lots to become single families or duplexes. Um, this has happened before. It wouldn't be the first time. Um, I also, you know, there's also, on the other hand, you know, a mixed-use building would. Yeah, there are other kinds of mixed-use buildings that could be good. I'm sure Mr. Doherty has a plan B, but the main point I want to make is nice commercial projects like this don't come our way very often, and there's not necessarily one waiting in line behind it. Thank you. Thanks. Michael Sandler. Hi, good evening. I live at 18 Pierce Street. Uh, I'd also like to... Um, Echo Ann's uh, request for elevations um, from Pier Street. Uh, the fact that it would feel like a six-story building um, directly behind us, I think, needs to be addressed visually. Uh, I think that would be quite, uh, quite visceral. Uh, this is a neighborhood. Um, it really is. Um, when I went to the building department to get a permit for my house, and I said that I lived on Pier Street, I was still oh, the cut-through street. Um, and I said, well, actually, um, people live there. And um, I don't, I haven't seen any evidence of a traffic study. Uh, it is absolutely a cut through. That's how people avoid Mass Ave. From Forest Street, they take a right onto Pier Street, then they duck out on Clark. It's very busy. There is high traffic in the morning. Um, there are lots of kids in the neighborhood. Um, my own children and those um, students at Audison. And um, if we know anything about middle school students, they're not the most um, aware of young people of where they are. Um, in the streets, on the sidewalk, around construction. So that is of um, a strong concern to me. Um, I'm curious about how um, pickups for laundry and trash would affect uh, those of us in the neighborhood. Um, it seems to me that, a, uh, that trucks would need to back up the entire length of the building in order to access trash pickup, uh, which would um, be quite a disturbance. And having worked in the restaurant business for many years, um, I'm aware of those hours for drop-offs and pickups. Uh, that would not lend character to our neighborhood uh, one bit. Um, in regards to the traffic, or excuse me, the parking situation, I think it's um, naive at best to say that our neighborhood would not turn into a parking lot. Um, I used to live in East Arlington, um, actually close to the close to the hotel, and um, there. There were constantly cars that were parked um, so that I could not access my driveway. Um, it was uh, a constant fight uh, between me and the, the business neighbors that I had. And um, when people park on Pier Street, if they park, it, it's not that wide a street. If people are parked on either side of the street, it leaves a single lane. That street curves. It's impossible to see um, what's coming at you. When cars flying down, during commuting times, it's dangerous as it sits. Um, I can only imagine what it would be like with a giant construction project taking place, um, with the number of um, with the number of people who are already using, utilizing that road as a cut through. Um, I have strong concerns about the safety, and I think a uh, traffic study is is long overdue, and I don't think it would necessarily um, be the benefit. Uh, those looking to push this forward to have that um, to have that information. It's already it's already challenging. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Don Seltzer. Can you use your charts to demonstrate things to the audience? Sure. Thank you. Microphone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, speaking here tonight on behalf of the Arlington residents for responsible redevelopment. Uh, we have reviewed these plans in detail, and we'd like to share our findings with the board and the audience here. 
And Aaron, thank you very much for having going over my comments and providing your analysis. And I'm going to defer responding to them this evening. Instead, I'd just like to use my time to explain to the public here what some of the technical points were that we were discussing earlier. Uh, the first one is, this is obviously a corner lot. And what the bylaws say is that on the side street, on Clark, that the setback of the building has to be the same as whatever is required in the adjoining zone beyond it. And it's R2, and that requires a 20-foot setback from the property line. And obviously, there's, there's zero setback on this building, so that's the question. Uh, the next thing that comes up is this idea of upper story setback. What the bylaws say is that um, on a building of this height, once you get to the third floor or 30 feet, whichever is less, you have to have a setback, a step back of seven and a half feet or more. Uh, an argument has been made that since the lower level is stepped back, you don't have to do it at the third floor, as the bylaws say. I think that will be something that the board is going to debate in the future. One thing I would like to note, though, is that inspectional services and the bylaws, the way they define the front of the building is by the nearest structure. So those columns that you see right here along the face actually define the front of the building, not the area under the overhang. Um, the next issue is the bylaws require um, a certain amount of what's called usable open space, and it has dimensional uh, values associated with it. And as far as I can tell, there's nothing in the application that addresses the usable open space, and nothing in this drawing here would qualify under what the bylaws say. I won't even address the issue about whether pervious brick patios could constitute landscaped open space. Uh, the next big issue, and this is really a big one, is there's a limitation on how big a building you can put in any size lot. This is a 14,000 square foot lot. Um, it has what's called a floor area ratio of one and a half. So that means you can build a 21,000 square foot building there. Um, the applicant is asking for relief from it. And one thing I find a little disturbing about the new plans is that nowhere do the plans actually indicate what the floor area is for each floor of the hotel. Uh, we have gone through the numbers and we have found that the gross floor area is actually 26 thousand square feet, almost 5,000 square feet more than what is allowed. And furthermore, the bylaw says that this relief that they're asking for under something called bonus provisions, it's section 5.3.6, I believe, it only applies if the lot is more than 20,000 square feet, and the lot is only 14,000. Don, that's three minutes. I'll let you finish your point. Okay, okay. Um, there's problems with the elevations. Um, quickly, this shows it level. This actually drops off by four feet from this end to this end. This affects building height measurements. Um, the other question is, the applicant said that this driveway slope here is only a 5% grade. That just doesn't add up. The way I see it is, this is about 20 feet to driveway ramp. It seems to fall off by at least four feet. That's a 20% grade, which is simply a, a dangerous grade to um, be backing up out of, coming up off of. And uh, thank you for thank time. you. Uh, Chris Loretti is next. Thank you, Mr. Before I start, I'd like to put this far back. Thank you. Chris Lurie, 56 Adams Street. Um, first thing I'd like to point out is that in the revised application, there's a key document missing. And that is the table the applicant's supposed to 
supply that was the dimensional uh, data for the, for the project in relation to what's required. It was incomplete in the initial application in July. It was completely missing in the latest application. I suggest the reason for that is it often doesn't meet the requirements. Um, one thing I also want to uh, dispute is the fact, or the statement that this is not a residential development in any way. I suggest you take a look at the uh, table of use regulations. In this zoning district, hotels and motels are listed under residential. That suggests to me that the motel, hotel portion is indeed residential, and therefore the usual open space requirements are triggered. Um, as for this bonus provision, that does not apply to lots less than 20,000 square feet. It does not apply to the B2 zoning district under section 5.3.6C. And moreover, the land that they're um, suggesting would be deeded or and he's been granted to the town, and it's not clear exactly where that is, does not count towards landscape to open space. And it doesn't appear to me that this area of, it could be considered landscape to open space either. That's a patio, presumably for the use of the restaurant. And my definition of landscape to open space is trees, shrubs, ground covers, grass, etc. So it clearly isn't, this, this project clearly doesn't meet the uh, landscape to open space requirement either. And I'd also like to touch on the point that previous speakers have brought up about hotels not being allowed in the B2 zoning district. Because one of the things I'd like to introduce as part of my testimony is the certified transcript of the 2016 town meeting uh, session at which mixed use was approved. And it was approved based on the description given by the redevelopment board, including its chair, Mr. Bunnell, and a number of the members of the board at the time, Mr. Kayer. And Mr. Kayer said, and I quote, uh, speaking of the head of inspectional services, Michael Byrne, he says, you know, we, we work with the head of inspectional services as well as town council on the wording that's before you, and only the uses that are permitted in a particular district are the ones that can happen in a mixed use in that district. To me, that cannot be any clearer. And I appreciate Mr. Watson's suggestion that you go to town council to get clarity on this, but I would think having three attorneys on the board to be able to do that yourself. And if you do want to go outside, I really recommend you go to an outside council, somebody completely outside of the town, to get an objective read on this. Town council works for the selectmen. This is the selectmen's project. And I suggest a lot of the problems with it is because the selectmen are pressuring you to approve a project that clearly doesn't apply doesn't comply with the zoning bylaw. You need an objective opinion for whether that case, particularly as it relates to this use question, because um, I think it's very likely that should you approve this, it's going to be appealed. And you need someone who's going to be able to give you an honest opinion, not someone who's going to give you a political opinion. Thank you. No, no, please no applause. It's inappropriate, and, and I will allow. Uh, I'd like for this to be uh, entered into the record. Thank you. I will accept that. I will post it with the meeting materials. Thank you. Uh, Eileen Park. Hi. So since we just need to like speak the you know small three minutes parking. Once again, it's a very big issue. I live in, uh, I live at 25 Pier Street, and I totally agree with all my neighbors. I do like to see the rear elevation, because from my house, it will totally look like six or seven story high. So that will be, you know, something to consider. And as my other neighbor said, it is cut through street. And I take my daughter to school in the morning, Cars are driving really fast. The other day, I almost got hit by Mustang going like at least 50 miles an hour. Cut through street. And we also have neighborhood kids walking there, playing there, riding bicycle. With that traffic and then all the dock loading on the Clark Street, it's gonna block the street and all the car will still be going through that street. So I don't like, Pleasant to look at, that's great. Coming from the Mass Avenue, from East Arlington to Lexington, that's great. But you have to think about the safety of the neighborhood because from as is, from um, Forest Street and Clark Street, it is really hard to make it to Mass Avenue 
when there is an incoming traffic. So the fact that we actually have this project with nice rendering without no traffic studies to go over it before you even check the neighborhood's <coughs> safety issue first, this is a little bit, I, I think it's like, it's, 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 something's out of order. So, you know, further discussion is great, but I think we need to get the uh, public hearing on the traffic studies first. And also, it is very crucial that they need to maybe possibly do a survey with the neighbors because us living in Pierce Street, Clark Street, and we're dealing with this issue every single day. Everybody can tell you there is an issue. So I think it's like it's almost pointless like going through, yeah, it looks nice on the side, it looks nice from the front. It doesn't really make sense because you also have like middle school kids like Two o'clock in the afternoon, you have crazy teenagers out the street, walking across the street without really looking at the traffic. And on top of that, this issue, like with the, tra uh, the construction going on, is going to be a hell broke loose. So I think we, be before even considering going into further, like discussing what the design looks like, and you know, like is it, is it good for the, you know, building codes and whatever, like they need to take care of the safety of the neighborhood first and then going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I have Jordan Cass. Thank you. I'm at 37 Pierce Street, just a couple houses down from the neighbors we've talked previously. So I have Similar concerns, but it's actually, I don't think it's as big of an issue. Um, to me, the, the traffic cut through is not really the, the development's problem. It's more of the town problem. It's, if it's already a concern, it shouldn't be uh, on these guys to, to be a concern about it already being a cut through. So that is not something that I'm too concerned about because it's already an issue. So it should be a town issue, not the specific development issue. And as far as parking goes, especially um, for the, the restaurant portion, it's public street parking. It's not pleasant when people park in front of your house, but it's public parking, so people are allowed to park. So, you know, it's, it's unpleasant. Nobody likes people parking in front of their house that's not them, but it's public parking. There's people parking in front of my house that aren't me anyway. You know, that's what the public parking's for. If we don't want public street parking, that should be a town issue that is not the development issue. So while I understand that, that you know, my kids are the ones that ride, ride their bikes in the street, you know, it's riding bikes in the street. It's not safe anyway, right? Like, you do it because it's fun right now, but then you still have to be able to get off of the street. So while, as long as there's uh, adequate parking overnight for the hotel guests, um, because there's obviously no legal parking overnight in Arlington, the restaurant parking is already street parking all over Arlington. Street parking is allowed in the town. So that's, that's my comment as far as the, the parking goes. Thank you very much. Uh, Nell Spry. Thanks. Um, I'm not in the neighborhood, so I don't know about parking and traffic. I'm at 11A uh, Academy Street, right across the street uh, from here. Um, I would absolutely love to have this hotel if the people in Arlington Heights don't want it. I think it'd be great. I think it would make, but maybe if it was more interesting, the design. I mean, to be able to think of, could we have something that we could actually be proud of? It looks a little bit like the boxes that are being put up everywhere throughout the, uh, um, in this whole, in this whole, well, actually, the whole country. It, it does, they, they all look the same, I think, a little because of all the zoning restrictions that are so so detailed, but somehow still similar throughout towns, throughout the, uh, really, Massachusetts, for sure. So the buildings all look the same. I think something a little bit that we could be proud of might be nice. Uh, maybe something that had an eco dimension, too. Um, net zero solar panels on top. There people were complaining about the trees being cut down. How about green walls? You know, it's never going to, I mean, well, it's, it's been done a lot, like in Milan, you know, there's a, there's a building which where the, the walls are all green, and we don't want, I mean, does it have to be another boring building that, like, neighborhood character or what have you? I mean, 
Yeah, if you guys don't want it, let's put it, can it be an Arlington Center? Can we have something really amazing? And maybe, maybe, maybe all of the usual opposition would be diminished if there was something that was actually given to the neighborhood. I mean, to the people who are, I mean, is it just going to be another expensive restaurant and, uh, you know, and more traffic? What about a kid's play center? What about something that could actually be a contribution for the people that are living there? You know, I mean, I, maybe I, I remember there was this bike repair, like self bike repair thing at the Cambridge Library, for example. I mean, you know, there's there's probably many different ideas, but maybe maybe the opposition would be less if there was some sort of um, a little bit more of a give and take, and not just a another somewhat unaffordable restaurant and uh, more cars coming in the neighborhood. So, ideas for both sides. Thank you. Carl Wagner. Thank you. I'm Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road. Um, the last speaker mentioned give and take for the neighborhood, and it, it strikes me that that is very important in the changes that we make to the town. We have to think about how the folks that live around these buildings will cope with it, because they moved into their neighborhoods because they expected it to be a certain way, and if it changes, it should change positively. And likewise, for us as a town neighborhood of all the 40,000 people that live here, things should be positive. So I applaud the board and the select board and the applicants for going and putting in something that's commercial because people have probably heard recently that when we have the press for density, that's residential density, it hurts us all because our taxes all go up. A commercial development should not hurt our taxes. It should help our taxes to go down. So that's really good. Unfortunately, there's a problem I see here that others have mentioned. You can see it in the pictures, or you can see it later online in the pictures. The parking situation is, is, is not appropriate for this use, or at least not the way the building is sized. 50 rooms, no parking essentially, maybe a bit in the back, but you can see in the pictures, this is a very large building in a neighborhood that was designed for much smaller buildings. And people have said the zoning isn't even allowing the building by the 2016 ARB discussion. So that concerns me. Uh, another thing that concerns me is the, the, the way that this is being justified, even though it is not legal by the bylaw on mixed use buildings, is that the town meeting said we should have this. I think if these kind of buildings go through, town meetings should reevaluate the law that makes even the legal version of what this building wants to be so that we don't get this anymore. So. If, if this goes through, like the building next to Stop and Shop and like a couple others I've seen, this says we've got to change our laws to make things better. The last comment I'd have is I understand that uh, normally about $5,000, $3,000, $2,600 is going to be asked for as, as a, a non-payment to the town by the applicant. I would hope that I've heard that the applicant has up to $100,000 of fees that they're not going to have to pay. I would hope the applicant will willingly give to the town that money instead of allow the town to not charge them that money. And I would hope the ARB will not approve the project unless the town officials get the fees that a building like this would normally give to us, the businesses and the residents of Arlington. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public that wish to speak? That's the last name on my list. Uh, in front here. <coughs> Name and address, please. Okay. Um, Kristen Anderson. I live at 12 Upland Road West, which is in Morningside, but I work on Lowell Street, and um, I ride my bike to work. Um, I walk to work um, and walk home from work, and sometimes I drive. And the intersection that I'm, I try to avoid at all costs is um, Downing Square. And so when I drive to work on Lowell Street, um, I will drive off of, get off of Mass Ave onto Lowell Street. And when I'm leaving work, I will come down, uh, come up Lowell Street and then take a left onto Mass Ave. And that is a very uh, difficult <coughs> intersection um, to, to take a left onto because um, when you look to the right at oncoming traffic, um, from the heights, that's like a 270 degree turn, where you're like that, trying to see traffic. So I would ask, and I don't know if it's within the purview of anything that 
folks are responsible for here, but I'd ask that a light goes in at that intersection when you add all this additional traffic um, with this hotel. And then the other thing that I noticed, and this might just be because um, these drawings aren't uh, terribly realized at this stage, um, but this, uh, I walk the sidewalk quite a lot, um, and I think that if this part of the sidewalk here where you've got this curb cut is um, just black asphalt to ma match the street, it's gonna be very confusing for people to realize that they're supposed to cross here, that this is you know, still part of the sidewalk, so I would ask that that be um, color that matches the sidewalk so that that's clear, because I'm, I'm familiar with some uh, hotels that have this kind of um, ink, uh, what do you call that? That cut in like that. Um, That's a curve. Curve, and we yeah. can certainly make it that. Yeah, just concrete, sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, no problem at all. That would be less confusing for people, and those are the only two observations I have. Thank you. Uh, I'm just trying to show you, it's Joanne. Joanne Preston at 42 Mystic Lake Drive. Um, and I'd like to talk about something that hasn't been really addressed, which is the issue can you see this? Um, of the trees. Um, and I apologize not to get my letter to you uh, earlier, but I decided I had to make a site visit and go out and look at the site itself. And it really doesn't look like this because the this um, plan endangers this two large street trees by paving over a large portion of the tree strip, which is the land that's owned by the people of Arlington. It doesn't belong to the developer. And the, it's much too close, it doesn't look like in this picture, but if you go out and look at the site, you know that it is, it's supposed to be, what? five feet, five feet here. And what will happen is there, there isn't enough room for the root beds. And that's really extremely important. As you know, um, the select board has said we are committed to climate resiliency. The best way to remove carbon, atmospheric carbon, is through trees. Street trees are particularly important for that. So I think the tree warden should be involved, not after it's all built and the trees are dying, that they should be, he should be consulted now, and that the actual amount of space has to be calculated right here. Uh, secondly, which has also been mentioned, is the 50% Brick surface is supposed to um, count for a large part of the 200 square feet, square feet required landscape open space. I mean, bricks are not landscape open space, and that certainly should be addressed again. Um, finally, um, I looked at several of the plans and Sometimes the trees are there, and sometimes they're not. And I think we heard that one of them is going to be cut down, and it's in the protected area that the tree amendment to the tree protection law addressed at the last town meeting. The small plants, whatever they are, you can't see in the back there, that are replacing it will not have the effect of removing all of the carbon emissions from the trucks, the cars, the buses, and all the pollution which will just drift down to the neighborhood. So I think that before this becomes so advanced that these should be important considerations. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. 
Hi, I'm Tara Bradley, uh, 28 Clark Street. Um, so um, I'm not really sure how to feel about this project. I was um, very excited about it. I um, went into this really excited, wanted to see kind of something different in that space, especially something exciting like a restaurant. Um, and just a quick question, I did a quick Zillow search. Um, Mr. Doherty, um, have you, oh sorry, have you been, um, have you owned this property since 2012? I don't own the property. I'm oh, you don't own the property? I'm the trustee of the- Ah, the okay, sorry, so- That owns the property. Okay, so you don't have any control over it at this time? I just said that I'm a trustee. Okay. Yeah, so you, a trust owns the property. Okay, I guess I'm trying to figure out, so um, do the people who um, own the, the businesses, the like auto businesses, I guess, um, I guess who is their landlord? Who is in trust? Okay, so I guess my questions, um, or my concerns was, um, you know, I'm excited to see something new going into the space because it's it's quite an eyesore right now. Um, and then I'm realizing that it seems like the same person who's owned the space has owned it for a period of time. Um, and what I'm wondering now is what kind of care is going to be taking care of this property if it's, you know, owned by the same person who or or trust or organization that lets a van sit there with flat tires for a year and a dumpster full of God knows what there. Um, Really, it's, it's just, it, it seems like there, there must be certain rules or um, stipulations in, in a contract or lease that the, that the organization has with the tenants um, that they could use to enforce some kind of cleanliness standards, um, or if not laws themselves. So I guess what I'm trying to um, say is that um, I urge the board to kind of consider how well um, this organization has taken care of um, the property in the past and what kind of neighbor they've been in the past and I'm not sure exactly the logistics of what agency Mr. Doherty will have coming on to this but if this is the way it's been taken care of in the past what is it going to be like what kind of corners are going to be cut going forward with this thank you yes ma'am Hi, I'm Marina Darla. I live at uh, 6 Clark Street, right across the street from the proposed property. Um, in addition to the concerns uh, voiced by my neighbors, I probably missed two questions. One, till what time is the proposed restaurant supposed to be open? Um, and what kind of restaurant um, there is in mind? So there is a difference between small family owned place uh, versus, you know, a party place. Um, so I would, I would want to know what the board has in mind for it, and till what hour we're expecting to see lights and music, and whatever it is. Uh, question number one. Question number two. I'm sure it was addressed, and I probably missed it. How long is the construction expected to take? Uh, I want to know for how many months, years, whatever, I'm expected to live in a construction site because I'm like literally six feet from the property. Thank you. Thanks. Jim, do you want to answer those questions? Um, oh, sure. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Congratulations on your recent purchase as well. <laughs> Not happy, huh? No, so I'm true. happy with purchases. Oh, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, in terms of uh, the restaurant itself, it's going to be an upscale restaurant. That's, that's the type of restaurant we haven't identified, um, nor committed to a particular tenant at this point. And uh, the hours ultimately uh, will be set by the Board of Selectmen um, when a, when a um, um, liquor license is issued for the restaurant. Um, but we don't, it's, it, we're not looking to run a nightclub. So we're not looking to, to run something late in, into the evening that will be like, any other um, upscale restaurants that exist in the town of Arlington currently? Uh, construction. Construction. Period. Construction. Sorry about that. Uh, well, you know, it depends on the permitting, obviously, because uh, when you get through permitting, it's a seasonal thing. Um, but um, you know, if everything goes well um, and we get at the right time of year it would be within a, a year 
and as it relates to construction, um, you know, the outside will be done first, and from from that standpoint, uh, the overall impact of that diminishes greatly within a matter of months. So once the envelope's tied in, um, but um, you know, we anticipate it being one year again, depending when you hit the ground um, with the approval. So. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Uh, in the green shirt, sir, and then you with the hat and the mask. Yes. Uh, my name is Jock Hoffman. I live on Rubley Street up in the Heights. Um, so I have no, uh, I empathize with the people who live near this project. Um, however, I'm excited to have something that I can walk to, bike to, have my family come and stay at. Um, the Heights has suffered. I feel sorry for all the little businesses that have gone, uh, that have failed because there's not enough foot traffic. So anything that generates foot traffic in our neighborhood, I'm for it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Michael Riley, I uh, live at uh, Five Lock Street for the last 20 some odd years. Um, a couple of things, uh, road remediation, because I know there's a, a rodent problem within that general area, especially by the brook, uh, how that will be addressed. Also, is the permit being voted on tonight? No. To start this, okay. I'm just wondering, because there really needs to be the traffic study um, to really understand what's going on with the uh, craziness of that intersection, especially first thing early in the morning. Um, and also uh, to come to uh, some thoughts on what's already been parked in the back of that building for the last five or six years with uh, closed containers, vehicles with flat tires, uh, and a lot of junk back there already. I don't know who's responsible for that. Is it the people that run this trust, and if so, um, will they continue to have that type of attitude with just parking trash um, without regard to the neighbors? Uh, that you can see this has been an ongoing issue for um, five or six years anyway, with a pile of trash, you can drive by and look at it. Vehicles broken down, just sitting there, whether they're taking up space or what the issue is with that. That's all, thank you. Thank you. If anyone else wishes to speak to the hotel issue? All right. <clears throat> you'll, have addition, sorry. you'll have additional opportunities to speak to this, I'm sure. Uh, if you have further comments or concerns, please forward them to the entire board, uh, planning director via email. Uh, if you send it well enough in advance, <clears throat> typically by the time our agenda is posted, it will be made public by the time we actually have a meeting. Uh, anything else that's coming this evening, I will uh, see that staff puts that up uh, as soon as possible for reference, including uh, Mr. Seltzer's email, which was referenced uh, earlier this evening. So uh, I'm going to bring it back to the board. I think we've heard a number of things that uh, we would like the applicant to come back with. Uh, I have a list, uh, but I'm sure that will be added to. <clears throat> we're looking at, at least from the applicant, uh, we need a detailed site plan, including a topographic analysis. Uh, I think we need an employee parking and transportation and management plan, including that off-site parking agreement you had mentioned, Mr. Dory. Uh, I know there's been a couple of, a couple of different discussions of that. I think that'd be helpful in understanding where traffic uh, cars will go. Um, and I think we need a traffic study to account for <clears throat> those intersections. And certainly we understand, uh, as my gentleman said, that this is a town problem, an existing town problem, uh, <clears throat> that certainly you can't come in and fix, but we need to understand what the new impact will be. Uh, even if it's, if that's, that, that people are taking Ubers and Lyfts, we need to see that right from, from someone qualified to do so. Uh, to the folks who are frustrated by existing traffic conditions, uh, unfortunately, we are not an enforcement agency, but I understand your concerns and I share your concerns. Uh, and I would encourage you to contact 
uh, whatever department in town you feel is appropriate to address those, whether it's the building department or public safety. Uh, I know other neighbor of other neighborhoods in town that have had some success with uh, beefing up police enforcement for a brief period of time to get people to just slow down as they're on their way through. I got pulled over once myself, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I would encourage you to, to do that and, and air your concerns because certainly traffic is an issue we all face in town, uh, but let's, let's try to address it. I'll speak with you after the fact. Okay. Um, so are there any other items we wish? Gene, go ahead. Just a couple. One, one occurred to me uh, when one of the uh, folks who spoke talked about walking not around that little curve, but mm -hmm. across. I wonder if you should have crosswalk. And well, we could do any of that. I'm, I'm just wondering whether you should have crosswalk and handicap curve, ramp, cuts. curve sure. cuts. So if people don't want to go along the curve, they can they can go that way too. So that's one. And, and the second has to do with the part of the site that's now the auto graveyard. I don't know exactly what to call it, precision tire. Was that ever a gas station, do you know? Um, I think maybe in the 50s. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really concerned that there needs to be a site assessment for pollution. There, there, already done there was, can you? Can you can you supply the can you supply the staff can you just supply the staff with that report because I'd, I'd just like to take a look at it and make sure that they're not going to be doing construction where there could be some contamination there was nothing on the site there was one also down on the DAV as well but that didn't rise to the same level okay thanks go ahead Rachel Sorry. I'll just I'll speak just loudly. Try. Okay, I think that the other thing that that we heard that you talked about, um, Aaron, as well, was that we need a, a detailed zoning um, assessment. Um, you know, in terms of the way that you're meeting all of the different requirements. Sure. Thank you. Right. Good. When do you think you would like to come back, um, Mary? Please, uh, Jim. I think we should get back to you on that. Oh, they need to continue. We need to continue to a date certain. Um, when are you meeting in March? Uh, First, uh, in, in March, it is, sorry, my calendar went dark. Um, <laughs> March 2nd and March 16th. Um, but uh, March is typically also when we hold uh, the, the war article public hearings. Um, so those are the two dates that we have scheduled. Um, Okay, so we'll continue that to, to March before we, we do that. Um, I do think we have to vote on the special permit uh, fees, <coughs> and we can have Aaron go. I asked Aaron to. Sorry, is there a question? Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll continue that eventually <coughs> this evening to March 16th. Uh, but we as a board do need to deal with this issue of the special permit fee that was put in the RFP. Uh, it's been clarified a number of times <clears throat> that the fee that's being, uh, the fee that's been requested to be waived is a special permit application fee, and the amount is approximately $2,600. The actual, uh, actual amount is in our meeting materials. Uh, the applicant has paid a 50% fee covering uh, a portion of the property, so he's already paid into, into that. Uh, the, the waiver of the special permit was something that was selected, suggested by the select board uh, during the RFP process to encourage uh, buyers at the site. So I'm happy to open that up to a board discussion of that or just move along to a vote uh, to work that. It's part of the purchase and sale. And it is part of the purchase and sale agreement. Can I ask a question? I, I believe that. Um, I believe that at our first hearing, when, when Jenny was present, um, there was mention of a 50% reduction in the special permit fees. Is that what we're voting on, or is it the full waiver? So we're voting on a 50% reduction. 50% has already been paid by the applicant. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> 
I understand that uh, the proposed fee waiver uh, was uh, made part of the agreement for, for purchasing the property, but uh, I um, have a problem with the, the lack of, of process uh, that led to that, um, particularly uh, that the select board um, made that agreement without you consulting this board. Um, uh, and that's without getting, even getting to the question of whether or not we actually can reduce the special permit fee. Um, so I'm, I'm not happy about the lack of process that, that occurred here. And, uh, you know, I'm, I can't support reducing the fee. Can I just, I just want to be a little more, be clear because I'm a little confused right now. We're only voting on the special permit fee. That's right. And only for half of the project. That's right. We're not voting on, and we have no jurisdiction on building permits or any other fees. Mm -hmm. So just right. the special permit fee. Just and only the special permit fee. Okay. And that special permit fee? was made as part of purchase and sales. Part of the RFP and part of the PMS that was signed, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to say a couple of, of things about this. And I, I think I'm in a different place than David is on it, except it would have been, I think, better to have a better process about this. But that's happened already. And as I read what the RFP was, I'll read it to the group, I'm sorry. It says, the town, this is from the Board of Selectmen and the town manager. The town through its Board of Selectmen and town manager is seeking proposals for the purchase and future use of the parcel. That's the DAV part, the part that the town owned. Um, with highly advantageous bidders accepting a 40 year deed restriction to require mixed use development of the property consistent with recent revisions to the Arlington zoning bylaws and defined as, quote, a combination of two or more distinct land uses such as commercial lodging, research, cultural, artistic creative production, artisanal fabrication, residential, single multi-story structure, in other words, mixed use. And it says, such advantageous bidders shall receive waivers of building and special permit fees in additional consideration. So what the town put out for the RFP, and I'm not saying we would have agreed or not agreed if we were consulted, but what the town put out for the RFP was, if you, bidder, agree to a 40-year deed restriction for mixed use, in exchange, we will waive the building and special permit fee for the part of the project that's on the DAV, the town site. Because the town owns the property, the town has more ability to do that than it would if it were a privately owned property. Um, so it was a quid pro quo, and, and this developer came forward and basically said, I'll, give, I'll do the 40-year deed restriction, and in exchange, I'll get the 2,000 whatever special permit fee back. We asked the um, town council whether we and the select board had the authority to do that. And his response was yes, that we in the select board did have the responsibility to do that. And my feeling as a member of the, of the redevelopment board is that if the town council gives us his legal opinion that we have the ability to do something, we have to take that as correct. So based upon this put out by the Board of Selectmen, the response from the developer, the purchase and sale agreement, and that there is an exchange of value taking place here. Whether I would have done this or not at the time is irrelevant. It's what is the situation now. And I think the situation now is that we should approve it. I agree. I also concur and agree here with what you just said. Yeah. 
Thank you, Jane. I thought that was well stated, and I agree. So I think I would take a uh, motion to approve the 50% special special permit fee waiver. So motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. One opposed. Okay. Thank you. All right, so now I'll take a motion to continue this uh, docket, 1207-1211 as Ave, to March 16th, 2020. Location to be determined. So motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so you'll work with staff to get those materials and anything else you need. Uh, <clears throat> I'm assuming that most of you are going to leave before we open the next public hearing, so I'm going to take a five-minute recess uh, and allow that to take place. But please remember, it's five minutes. We'll continue to pick up at 9.30. Thank you. So I will reopen the meeting here. Uh, thanks everyone for your patience. Thanks to the Apophka folks for sticking around. Uh, we do appreciate it. So I'm going to reopen EDR uh, continued public hearing, special permit number 3610, filed by Apophka, 1386 Mass Ave. Gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, thank you for providing all your additional materials to walk us through what's new and what questions you answered and we can proceed from there. Great. Uh, thank you again. I'm Phil Silverman uh, from Vicente Cedarburg on behalf of OFCA. Uh, Tony Capuchetti is the civil engineer that's been working on this project, and Joseph Lukacs is the company's uh, CEO. Um, you have your microphone? Oh. Ah, Still need the microphone. I love the microphone. Okay. Um, so, a couple of uh, things we wanted to, uh, staff was kind enough to sort of lay out for us the different things that we need to cover with you. And so we're just going to take them one by one uh, and go through them. But first, there was a concern uh, on signage. Uh, and where our prior uh, plans showed uh, how we were going to do the signage. And we've, we've taken the advice. Is it in there, or do we? I'm not sure. We, yeah, we don't have that one. It's in your package, though. Do you have it on the package? Yes. Yeah. Um, fantastic. What you can see is originally, I think we had the sign on the window. And uh, the board requests that we move it. There's a sign band along there. And so uh, we moved it along that sign band. And um, uh, it is a backlit laser cut sign, uh, which I think was also uh, suggested. And, and we agreed to go with that. So um, that's what it is. Um, is there any other questions about that? Or have we covered that? Uh, well, you still, st still left the logo on all the windows. We Much did. smaller and reduced. In this rhythm here, we did. Is, is that is problematic? That, well, I was going to ask: Is that part of the signage? That count as signage? It could. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. So, yeah. does that add up with the sign you have above the square footage? I think my understanding is it's twenty-five percent uh, of the window area. So, I think if you look at those, uh, you can sort of see that it's not—it's probably not even ten percent uh, if you added it up. But I think we understand. <laughs> What he said is, I double-checked it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I, I, sorry, I do sure. have a question just about the, the backlighting. So you're showing, um, is it is it a green light that's behind it or a, a white light? That is, yeah. Or is that a painted sign? Hi, yeah. Rich Schilbert, the director of construction. Yep. Yeah. Um, no, it's just going to be, a, 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 it'll just be a, a, a regular, you know, uh, dim white light. Okay. That shines from behind him. They showed it in green rendering on the drawing, I think, just to get it to stand out for you guys. That whole sign is only about three, it's just over three feet by, you know, by three and a half feet. That, that area that it can fit in above the doorway is rather small, so it dictates the, the size of that. Okay, so there's, there's, it's, there's no green powder coating, it's, it's no. just a stainless steel with yeah. the white light yeah, behind it. it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Um, second uh, item, uh, you were looking for a drop-off and pick-up uh, rideshare space uh, on the site. Tony, you want to? Thank you. Uh, Tony Capuchetti, the head engineering 63, Al Pass, Elm Street, Wakefield, for the record. Um, we did add a, a temporary uh, drop-off space. It's, it's labeled as a temporary standing spot. 
there'll be a sign that says standing for uh, rideshare pickup and drop off only. And the idea is that uh, the vehicle will get off of Mass Ave, out of the, uh, the accessible way, uh, park here, drop someone off, and then be able to exit without uh, impeding too much traffic. Uh, this would basically impact these two spots here. Um, but because it's a live standing and not a parking spot, uh, the vehicle can move pretty quickly in case there's some bearings in those spaces. Uh, but uh, it was my understanding that the, the board was looking for some place that would be the minimal uh, interference. And I didn't want to um, impede the actual exit way. I just think from a safety standpoint, having cars stopping in the exit way uh, would be problematic rather than uh, just slowly, uh, you know, minimally impeding these two parking spaces. Uh, for a temporary situation on the ride share. And, and many ride share drop offs may drop off in the area and walk to the same as well because it is a vital commercial area. What's the distance between uh, uh, the ride share space and the back of the uh, parking space? 15 feet. You, you could probably do it in three turns, uh, but you know, if, if it was a house driveway, 15 feet is about adequate to, to back out of your garage um, for. for for this, you want 24 feet of clear space in your uh, zoning ordinance, so that's what we're providing. I have a question on the right here. Go ahead. Um, I appreciate the the uh, concept for the ride share drop off and, and pick up. Um, I guess my concern about it is if people are are arriving via rideshare and they requested a rideshare to this address, what is going to prevent the rideshare driver who is not familiar with this location from just stopping in the middle of Mass Ave to let their drive, let their passenger out? Um, again, it'd be more of a courtesy issue. There's really no way to police that. However, the cannabis industry is very web driven. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of sites, uh, Popkin relies heavily on the, the Leafly site. Uh, we can actually put your order into Leafly and have it ready to pick up. Uh, I don't think there'd be an issue putting that on the website, but the ride share drop offs must be in the designated space behind the building. Um, I'd be more concerned with pickups than drop offs. Yeah. Well, e yeah, either way. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, making it clear uh, on the website that that's preferable would at least be helpful. In, uh, so even with the location when we launched, we actually put maps of, you know, for our temporary shuttle, everywhere to go, how it's all going to work. We're going to do the same thing here. Uh, we'll have areas for neighbors to not park here, shaded on the website. Um, and we would also have ride share has to come into here. Again, we can't necessarily police it, but we can encourage it. If we see any, any customers coming in, um, not utilizing this space, do it on Mass Ave. We will inform them the first time, the second time it's a little harder, and then we, don't, we won't necessarily allow them back. I, I did see uh, in your submittal um, uh, an example of, uh, of an A-frame sidewalk sign. Yes. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone had any other comments with respect to that, but it did occur to me that yet, yet another thing you might need to add to a sign like that would be uh, directing people to the ride share drop off pickup so that as the drivers arrive they see where they're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. We generally have a lot of tenants also. Yeah we do have a lot of tenants like we've spoken about numerous times mm -hmm. so I think, I think that between that it's you know as long as everything's legible because I don't want to make it like a... Yeah know, there's already work. quite a bit. <laughs> <time. laughs> exactly. I um, there's also uh, the ability to actually put a signage on the building, kind of like you can see in the airport, like right show with an arrow. Um, so there is that, that ability to fix something like that to the actual building at the entrance to the parking lot. So I, I think if, if it seems like there's a problem, uh, then I, I think uh, come back to the planning department to discuss uh, what additional signage may be necessary to address that. Absolutely. And one of the things you'll see is uh, a draft of the MOU with the Arlington PD, and as you can see, we, there's a lot of different levers we can pull, not with, just with the APD, but with, with the actual town officials to make sure that if anything's not going perfectly smooth, we could address it. There's a lot of levers to pull on that. 
Just, sorry, just with regard to the to the ride share, there, there's no place for someone to actually wait though, right there. So you'd have them wait at the corner, and then when they're riding, it comes up, you they, they don't know. That okay. that's correct. Uh, and, and again, one of the reasons why the I believe the temporary standing would work is because of a lot of time that will be out there, you know, on a regular basis. And if someone's just standing there waiting, you know, like mm -hmm. ask them to to move along and come back. And, you know, Great. Um, the next issue uh, was there was a uh, an inquiry regarding the type of application that there would be on the windows. We did uh, provide an, an exhibit. Um, yeah, it's a it's a translucent film uh, that goes on the windows, um, and that's what we were showing. It sort of simulates frosted glass. That would be the idea. And again, I think we did show small symbols, the apophis symbols, on those as well. Uh, it has to be something. We, uh, I think that's your where you cannot be able to see inside the building. That's important to the CCC. Um, there's also uh, a question about the trim detail. That's also on the same exhibit. Um, I think it's a it's sort of a walnut color is what we're talking about right now. Is that right, Rich? Yeah. Sand would be finished that wood to match the existing, you know, uh, wood that's on the first floor there. It's, it's, it's similar to like a walnut, light walnut stain. Um, now also, uh, there were uh, questions regarding the floor plan. Uh, you wanted to see the separation between the entry area and the rest of the building. Um, I don't know it's not on there. Um, I, I do have a, I think you've seen it. Seen them, you can see yeah. uh, the entry vestibule. Uh, there's also bicycle storage uh, inside uh, for employees. Uh, and also gender neutral bathrooms, which was also requested. I do yes. have one question. That wall you show yep. that separates that vestibule and the uh, say display area. Yep. Is that a solid wall and a solid door? It's a solid wall and a solid door, yes. Yes. Okay, so you actually have to be keyed, uh, buzzed into that. Okay, so it's not a window where you peek inside and see what what they're inside, so it's just you're into a dark wall. Uh, not not dark. dark. <laughs> you're, in, you're, you're into a vestibule that, that all you see is forward and a counter and that's it. Right. And only when you get buzzed in, you can see what's inside. Correct. Right. So the, the, what's indicated on the drawing as the coiling door, is, it, is that a counter yes. where so someone would walk up and check in, and, and, then they get, in. and then they get buzzed in through the, the side door into the showroom? Right. So it's similar to a doctor's office when you walk in, you got the glass. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next, Tony, if you could show them where there was some, we had bicycle parking previously, um, uh, you had requested if there was a way to fit in, yeah, I think we had four. Why don't you go ahead and tell them. Thank you, yeah, so the, the last site plan had uh, four bicycle spaces. There were two inverted U-frame uh, spaces, uh, no, U-frame, uh, I guess, bicycle racks. Um, and that was indicated as being preferable in the town's uh, bicycle guidance, uh, parking guidance document. Uh, they provide a six foot by two foot space, which is what was uh, specified. Uh, we were able to, uh, we were taking the sidewalk out, with, we we're proposing Kirby's Bayer Stone. Uh, and in that area, we can add a third one to, to get a total of six bicycle spaces outside for customers. I know Arlington is a bicycle oriented town, you have the main trail that comes through here, so I, I think adding additional spaces is a, is a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Tony, why don't you hit the next one, which is the stormwater and some of the stormwater? Uh, going back and forth with the, the applicants uh, construction team. When we first came in, uh, there was indication that a rain garden would be preferable. Uh, and there was some indication that the stormwater was bypassing some of the on-site basins and running off to Mass Ave. Uh, we looked at the site more and we're going to do a full, full depth reconstruction of the parking lot, uh, which will allow us to change some of the grades. And because of that, uh, we can break the, the watershed instead of where it breaks in the middle a little bit over. Uh, which I guess about 60% of the parking lot uh, to a rain garden. Uh, the issue we couldn't do the rain garden before was because of the piping from, the, we talked about a slot drain this way, and once you pipe it over, you go down three, four feet to the ground, which is not ideal. Uh, doing it this way, we're going to set the fair flush uh, and then put a, a, a curb behind it and then drop it down about 18 inches uh, where the water will pool, and then once they're over tops, It'll be directed to the existing catch basins. Uh, we'll take those catch basins, we'll clean them, and we're going to retrofit them with gas traps. Uh, but this is kind of more in line with 
uh, what was originally contemplated was using a rain guide. It'd uh, be very similar to, uh, as you walk into the back of the building here, uh, there's a couple of curb breaks with the depressed uh, landscape area. Uh, that's essentially a rain guide in there, although we're, we're looking at some taller grasses just to uh, improve the, the capture of sediment in the rain guide. So the water is draining across a sidewalk? No, there's no sidewalk in this area. We're proposing to remove all the sidewalk from, from this point on. Okay. So it would sheet across the parking lot, and then there's a, a level curve, flush, mm -hmm. and then the grass would drop off. It would pull in there until it reached capacity, and then it would continue down the metal line. So there's no walkway there? There's no walkway. Fine. Uh, I believe the, the next comment uh, we, talk, we touched on a little bit was the A-frame uh, sign. Uh, so uh, this is for, for neighbors uh, that are willing to put them out to, to kind of preserve some of their on-street parking as well as some of the, the private lots. And basically it's, you know, there's no apothecary customer parking allowed, uh, no on-site consumption, and the notice that if you're caught, uh, you could be uh, you're prosecuted and most likely banned from the apothecary facility. Uh, and that's something that the marijuana facilities have the ability to do pretty easily because it's computer uh, activated when you go in, they're, they're scanning your ID. Um, so it goes into their database and they can say, oh no, and, and it goes both ways. If you violated at the Lynn facility, sorry, you could be in from the pop, but very insane with the other things. So it's, it does limit their options. And, uh, it, is, it is a good policing tool for uh, customer pay. Um, the last item on the, the civil side of things, while I still have the microphone, uh, was the uh, access to the, or the, the traffic issues and looking at the net of the center. Uh, Netherbrook Land, we did a study out there, it was uh, June 2019, there were nine operating facilities in the state for, for recreational marijuana. I think we're, up, we're, we're approaching 40 now, and, and each opening it, it is better than the last. Uh, I think everyone's learned a lot. Um, however, looking at the, the net uh, trip generation numbers, you're looking at about 124 trip ends in the peak hour on a Saturday, which is 62 vehicles. Uh, the parking lot has 12 spaces, so to, to make the parking lot work, you'd have to turn customers over five times an hour, or every 12 minutes. Um, to, to make the numbers work based on our, our number of point of sales, it's about every six minutes. And uh, during the opening phase, uh, they, they actually track transaction, transaction times and win, and then we're doing about four minutes of customers. So it is physically possible to get that number of customers through. And, and it gets back to, as I was saying, the, the, the web-driven, uh, kind of app-oriented consumers that go to these shops. The menu's posted every day. They look at the menu. You can add them to your cart. You can kind of do a pre-order, and then you go in, and it's, yeah, I'm, I'm order 74. Okay, here you go. It's already been filled. Hey, you're in and out. And they, they really kind of mastered that sort of thing compared to the, the disasters that happened in the last year for a when they very first opened the facilities. Uh, so that those lines aren't happening. And again, I wasn't here last meeting, but we did a quick level of service analysis based on the volume to capacity ratio. Uh, we had about an additional 1% at the peak hour uh, as far as peak hour volume compared to what's out there. And it's a level of service C in the existing condition and a level of service C in the first condition. Not great, but still acceptable by the STAT standards. Um, then uh, I think the last couple of points. Uh, there was uh, a request that, that we conduct a tour uh, for the Arlington Police Department, which we did, I think, back on January 9th, uh, which went very well, and they were able to see how this works, which kind of leads me into the last thing that you were concerned. You wanted a summary of the memorandum of understanding that we're working on with the police department. We provided a summary, and the, the, the basic concept is that we set, we sort of schedule a number of meetings prior to opening, you know, a certain amount of time prior, a couple of months, a couple of weeks, day before, and then after opening, you know, a few days after, the next week, the next month. So we're constant, in constant communication uh, regarding what's going on. And then the other piece of it is, uh, it's sort of what I would call an, uh, an escalation of measures to the extent that you, you get high demand times. Um, you know, you, you People know, for example, that on uh, April 20th is a very high demand time. <laughs> 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 so that's, 
somebody's aware of that. Um, so, um, and, and there are other times, uh, and, and I, my sense is that as you begin operating, they will, you'll figure out, we'll figure out what are those high demand times. And so we'll obviously be doing things in terms of staffing to deal with that. But uh, from the perspective of the town, what we wanted to do was have sort of an understanding with the police that we're working on that, all right, if, if we know something's coming up, the first time we see this, you know, we will do some extra work on our website. We may, we may go as, so far as to discourage people from coming at certain times on the website, okay? That that might be a way to handle it. And there are a, a series of escalating measures all the way up to you have to make a reservation. That's not the one that we prefer, but if we understand that if we're working with the police and, and they determine, geez, this is not a great situation, can we go to that? We understand that that may be necessary, but again, it's sort of an escalating uh, formula that we have that we're working on. It's not finished yet. Uh, I sent it over to Mr. Heim uh, so that he could take a look at it and work on it. But you know, I'm hoping that we'll we'll have that done uh, within the next week to ten days. So uh, that's where we are on that. Any other questions or? No, I have not. No, no. Thank you for taking response. I'm mm -hmm. fast. Go ahead, Jane. I wasn't clear in reading the traffic study, which now includes Brookline things, that you actually use the Brookline things for anything other than just putting them in the traffic study to have a comparison. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. That's, so, and I apologize if I, if I misunderstood the question. Uh, the, the question as it was posed, or at least the way I read it, was how would we be able to handle the amount of customers. Um, but again, looking at the, the traffic volumes, and if you gave me five minutes, I could probably do the math out for you and let you know that we're not over. I mean, you're 20.8 to 21.7 using the existing numbers. You have the 32% of the volume to capacity ratio, so that's like another 320 vehicles in the peak hour. Um, so that's not going to happen with the the meta numbers. Uh, I thought the question was less about traffic and more about can the facility handle the influx of uh, cars in the parking lot and to in bodies without queuing people outside the building um, for an extended period. But uh, again, you're, you're looking at a 320 car difference in a peak hour situation and the difference between the meta study And what we use uh, is 44 trip ends or 22 vehicles. Uh, so the, we're, we're far from the, that, that threshold that would put us into a different level of service. So, and a, a two way highway, the, the, the way I came up with 320 vehicle to passenger ratio, the passenger ratio of a two lane road with no passing is 3,200 vehicles, passenger cars per hour. Um, so that would be 320 to, to add another 10% to what So help me out here. Maybe I'm just not understanding. On table two, trip generation, Saturday daily, Salem and Brookline, average observer rate per 1,000 square feet is 793.8, and it's like 2,000 square feet. That's, that's for the day. However, when you look at level of service for roadway, it's during the peak hour. Uh, generally, when you go to work, you come home from work. Those are your, mm -hmm. those are your two worst times for traffic. Um, so, again, that would be the same for the facility, uh, the peak hour. That's the that's your your largest influx. Uh, anything less, anything any other hour would be less than that cumulative adding up to that, that 1,700 for the day. And again, those those are trip ends. Uh, just to to remind everyone, each vehicle has two trip ends. One when you arrive to the facility, one when you leave. So uh, you divide that in half to get the number of actual passenger cars. So will your MOU with um, the Arlington Police Department have a provision in it about the opening day or opening week and how that's going to go? Well, yeah, I mean, because, because of the fact that we, I think, can all anticipate that the opening day is going to be, uh, you know, somewhat larger than what you might normally see, I think you'll see 
at least some of those preliminary measures, you know, the lower level measures go into effect where we uh, use our website to suggest times that would be best for people and such. I, we, again, we haven't finalized it yet. You know, I, I tried to summarize it for you, but there's no question that opening day, the opening day and the opening first week at a minimum, I think, are going to be times that, that we'll be looking to that. So, yeah. Just that, that um, in the MOU, you also see that what we're proposing with the Arlington BD is up to at least a month of, uh, of one actual uniformed officer there uh, providing a detail service. Yeah, I just want to make sure that during the opening day, week, month, whatever it is, that there'll be coordination with the Arlington Police and they'll be there. And Absolutely. If, yeah. if the numbers aren't so great, maybe not so good for you, but better for traffic, mm -hmm. and the other way around, yeah. if the numbers are really good, then at least you'll do something and the police can help. Yeah, I think, and, and I would also like to add that when, when we met with Arlington PD, one of the things I had suggested was they should speak to Lynn PD to see how we coordinated with them and what Lynn PD thought. They had already done it and they said that, they got, that we got a glowing recommendation from Lynn PD for how we coordinated with them because uh, it is a partnership. We want to make sure that we're able to service the, the people of the town as well as stay good with people of the town. So, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work that we do on our end to make sure that we're coordinated enough, honestly, not just with them, but Board of Health, uh, Pat over there, and you, all of you. <laughs> Any other questions from members of the board? The, <clears throat> Any members of the public wish to speak a little bit of public comment to the Apotheca matter? Going once, going twice, <laughs> closed. Public comment is hereby closed. <laughs> This. Is there anything else that we want to talk about for the board here? Uh, I feel <clears throat> fairly comfortable that this applicant has provided us what we've asked for. Uh, they been patient with us. Appreciate that. Uh, I, uh, I, I can see that, that you've gone to the, to the trouble of uh, presenting yourself as a good neighbor. Uh, I hope that that's going to keep on. Sure it will. Um, I didn't keep giving us any reason to doubt that. And I appreciate the, the fact that you've been responsive to our concerns uh, on everything from safety and security to signage. Uh, there are some conditions that I think we can go through. Jenny, if you could run through those, I think what I do is uh, at this point take a motion to approve with the following conditions. In the memo that was provided to the board, there are uh, there was sort of a summary of where we're at today, and then uh, slight revisions to our general conditions. Yes. I don't think um, anything really more than just talking about the waste removal, which is item number five, um, because there are specific rules about waste removal for marijuana waste specifically. I didn't want that to be conflated with regular trash mm -hmm. pickup. Um, it's not necessary they're aware of those rules and regulations, but we wanted to capture that as a clarity and condition. It actually wasn't in their original APOSCA um, approval, the other approval. Um, so that was one. Uh, the second one in the general conditions that we updated was just a slight uh, change to number six, making it clear that the drainage and surface water removal plan has been reviewed and approved by the town engineer. I don't know if after the discussion that you had this evening, you wish to amend that one as well further, but um, that was one that we slightly amended. And then there are four additional, or four special conditions, which are unique to this particular application. The first one is, um, of course, I think the one where there's the most continued need to make sure that we maintain this relationship and also address any issues as they, should they arise, and be able to also um, a sort of a back, of back and forth communications um, across multiple entities, including, of course, APACA. That through the MOU, that would be, uh, that has been drafted at this point in time, and that would be finalized and um, would be responsive, of course, to your decision. I don't know that I heard anything further specifically that should be in the MOU that's been discussed this evening, but maybe there's something more specific that you would like to add to that, but it is being drafted at this time. Um, the second item is just making it clear that we wish for this applicant to uh, ensure that they will be responsible for the cost of any additional police details. I think that's particularly important, especially in these peak 
times that may occur in the beginning, may occur on special holidays, you know, may, whatever the, there might be that's happening. I don't think that we can judge exactly when that peak demand will occur. This is a new facility in a new location in a different town. And so that's, that's something where we want to make sure that they're paying for the coverage of those police details. Um, and the third one is really the queuing, which I think is really critical, is to make sure that there's not any queuing, which would be out of the public way, but to make sure that that's clearly stated in this decision that we do not wish to see any queuing in the public way. And then the last one is really, a, I think, a more thorough vetting of that transportation demand management plan. We have a little bit of a sense of it, but I think further details would be needed. We heard, I think, a little bit about the employee parking and that there's an opportunity for a shared agreement with a, um, a neighbor potentially in Arlington Heights, but I think that needs to be further vetted as part of the TDM plan. Um, I guess the only other one that I might add for this conversation would be something about an additional sign related to, or signage related to directing potential customers towards rideshare. That was the only other new thing, but that could also just be a component of item number one under your general uh, conditions related to signage designs. I think the idea that they have a traffic <coughs> the tent that yeah. there is better is better mm -hmm. than signage. Yeah, I think I, I don't want to go I, overboard with signs. I no, I was, something we've tried signs. I was only interested in in looking at a sign if there was a problem that couldn't otherwise be solved, okay. and that they would come back and consult with with your office if that were to Well, that feels like occur. something that again could go into that MOU. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I think that yeah. that's something more of that back and forth coordination and management of queuing, management of demand, management of vehicles and people. That's kind of all part of this, and the safety and security, of course. Well, one thing we had previously discussed, and I, I think the um, I, I think the applicant had agreed to do this as part of their annual report mm -hmm. um, to include um, details on uh, what has happened with respect to traffic and parking over the course of, of the year and how, how things have changed over the course of the year. In the TDM or their annual, they, because they also are required yeah. to do a community meeting mm -hmm. annually. Yeah. Which one? Uh, I think in, in the annual report. So, so, um, so we, to we the give, community. We give the yeah. annual sales report to the town? Yes, all right. Yeah. Uh, so in there, we would, we, we, I said that we would include some statistics on how customers were arriving. Right. Uh, what's more of the transportation? Well, that exactly. that's part of the TDM as well. Okay. There's a required reporting. So okay. Well, however, however we want to phrase that, as long as we're we're definitely getting that. Um, well, I will just say and to duly report it yeah. per in the annual report to the town. Yeah. Because the the TDM plan, um, I I thought was more focused on on employees. Um, but, but we also wanted to the extent that they could collect it, get information on how customers were getting to the, to the location. Okay. I'll just add a fifth one. <laughs> feels, yeah. feels safer at this point. And one thing we talked about last time for the traffic demand management plan is something that specifically says that the employees will not be parking in in the lot, so it doesn't have to be here, but just mm -hmm. we want to see that. In the yeah, that will do part of the TDM, as long as not parking with the neighboring properties. Mm -hmm. Right. Just to be Okay. So those are the. So that's it. That was an additional one, but that was it. Okay. So we move to accept with the general and special conditions. Move to approve document number 3610. 3610. The conditions for the general and special is outlined by the director. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Congratulations. Move on to the next step. Thank you very much. Thanks for your patience. Sorry. Thank you. Moving here, uh, Jenny, you will walk us through potential warrant for uh, town meeting. Microphone? We might get the mic.
So first of all, I'll say there are a number of handouts up here that I made copies of things for should people need anything. So maybe we could get these around for the seven people in the office. <laughs> So the first, uh, the first one is to correct the um, two-year period to a three-year. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Two-year period to a three-year period, which is in the affordable housing requirements. Um, currently, that's just not in compliance with state law. It's 40A update that we wanted to capture. Did not get that. The second article in this package is to have a definition for apartment conversion which, as noted here, is described. And then the third item yeah. is... Do you want comments as we go along? Or wait to Why don't I go through, and then I want to go back to the one that is new. Because um, I had a couple wording changes on a couple of the others. Let me, let me go through the packet first. You need to vote to move these so that we can file them, because they're due on Friday. Okay. Yes. So um, if you don't want to, that's also your option. <laughs> if you want to... If you want to move them to town meeting, I need to be able to yeah. file the warrant articles by Friday, okay. which is the deadline, January 31st. Of course, if you decide not to, that's also your choice. Um, so these are mostly ones that we've talked about. The next one is, is a new one. This actually came from um, Rachel, who suggested that we create some language to address issues of parking reductions in the B3 and B5 districts. And it is, um, it would, it would be an allowance for the board to further reduce the requirement. You're currently allowed to reduce down to 25%. And if you decided to go further than that, in the case of a property being located in B3 and B5, you would be able to do so with some, with some requirements, including the ones that you typically utilize, like TDM, shared parking, off-site parking, et cetera, all the allowances that are available in 6.1.5 in order to do so. The reason that these two districts were chosen is because they are our major business districts, are, have a lot of B3 and B5 um, in them. Of course, as you know, they're quite colorful in terms of business districts. Um, so in other words, Arlington Heights, Arlington Center, East Arlington have multiple business districts. For example, Arlington Heights has has more than five in the coverage of the area that spans a very small vicinity, but the, they are predominantly covered by B3 or B5. Those technically should have, uh, allow, they technically have high allowances for higher densities and other things that can happen there which are um, important for business development and economic development, and parking can be a barrier in order to achieve those goals. The most recent, um, application that the board reviewed that relates to this particular article is the pub being proposed for 1314, um, 1314, 1314, Mass Ave. Seemed like it was 1336, no. 1314 Mass Ave, which as you know, after you approved that special permit, it needed to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and actually will be doing so tomorrow night to be, to request and hopefully be granted a zoning variance with, in relationship to required parking which would need to be zero in that particular case um, in order to be able to proceed to even move forward with their licensing process and opening process, et cetera. So that is a big barrier to a business opening in a neighborhood where many of the people in that community have expressed a desire for that particular use. So I think that this is uh, one way that there's a proposal to address it. We want it to be responsive to the board member who raised this, and so we've drafted an article to be responsive to that. The next article that is in this packet is um, 
simply administrative connect, uh, corrections. There are four of them here noted. I, uh, I don't think I'm going to go through them all, if that's OK. These are minor changes. And the no. next article, we can come back to all of these if you want me to go into greater detail. The next article is an amendment to gross floor area to clarify how landscaped and usable open space is calculated relative to gross floor area. This amends 5.3.22, as well as definitions in section two. And just, just to be clear, to folks sitting in the audience at yes. home and folks who may need a refresher, uh, <clears throat> this wording, this language, uh, this vote <coughs> tonight is certainly subject to change as we go through the public hearing process. Uh, this is simply the language that will be put in the warrant. Uh, as Jenny said, it's required to begin by January 31st. It's <coughs> Friday. Uh, we may reserve the right to change these articles or the full language is out there uh, or ultimately take no action. This is just a vote to move this to town, uh, to our next step in the process, <coughs> and then ultimately town meeting or not, as we have further discussions and have more public input. Correct. And you can choose to file a warrant article and decide to not pursue it any further as well. Filing the article doesn't even mean that it leads to the development of a motion or a vote or a recommendation. It could just be an automatic no action because you choose not to act on it. <coughs> the next one in this package is a zoning bylaw amendment to the tables. Um, one of them is noted below, 5.6.2. And then on the last page, there is an amendment uh, proposed here to establish that there are prohibited uses, which is not currently called out in our bylaw. Questions as we go through. Jenny, thanks for doing the work on these. I would like to thank Aaron and Aaron for doing the work. I actually forgot she was here since so you worked here the other day. Okay. I'm on the So, for example, we're only going to be voting in the article language and not not the not this right. other not yeah. the amendment. Not the, because I have it doesn't have to be at that level of detail. Right now, we need to file the warrant. Yeah, warm. just just, just the warrant. Yeah. So the only one at that level. That well, there are two. Um, no, there was just one that I had a concern about, mm -hmm. and that's and I'm in favor of this, but I'd like the wording change, and that's the one about reducing the parking requirement, mm -hmm. because it says reducing <coughs> the parking requirement to zero. It it feels like you you have to go to zero. I think it needs to say oh, something like yeah. to as low as zero uh -huh. or something like that, um, and then. So other than that, I have no problem with the wording of the articles, although I can send you something with some wording suggestions for what the bylaw change would actually look like. But that's, otherwise, I think they're all fine. I like that comment, if I might. Um, we, we gave certain language in the proposed amendment. If you turn to the next page in D, it says applicants may propose a reduction lower than 25% of that required. So, it's, um, and then N20, you know, so it's a very well, specific phrase. I, I'm, I would rewrite that whole sentence. Just in general. In general, because I don't think it's the applicant requesting one. I think you have to give us the ability to do it. So I think yes. it has to be, it has to be rewarded. But we don't have to do that today. I'll and, say that today. and in both cases, it doesn't necessarily have to be to, to zero. zero. But it makes it appear as the opportunity. Well, yeah. the, the, the preamble of that section actually gives the board the authority to do these things. Well, I'll, I'll so, send you. So we can, well, let's talk about the vote part for yeah. the, the yeah. actual yeah, yeah, amendment yeah. structure when we come to the meeting. But do right. you, is this language OK for other board members as low as? So the, the language would read to reduce the parking requirement to as low as zero in the. I have no problem. I think it's a good starting point. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. for the purposes of filing. Right. Yeah, for the purposes of filing, I think we want to keep it <coughs> as broad as legally allowed. I think that's fine. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. That was, that was all in terms of the warrant articles that I had. There were other warrant articles that were provided. In terms, do you want me to talk about those? Can we can we move these first? I mean, I you need uh, that's up to you, and um, that you need to vote to decide if you want to move these. 
right. to be able to let us file well, the what's the exact articles. wording? What's the exact wording we need for that? So we to to approve move. the warrant articles as drafted to file for town meeting. So move for the warrant. Okay. Second. All it's, in favor. it's just a warrant. Right. Uh, right. Uh, Great. Uh, There'll be an opportunity for, for public comment on those specific articles as we move through the process. Pre uh, there will be public hearings. There will be an entire process of yes. advertisement. Yep. As I said, this is not this is the beginning. As, as we do every there year. There's a lot to be discussed. Okay. So we have. So the, these were the ones that came, of course, from that will be filed and inserted by the board to make it very clear. And then we are aware of a number of citizen petitions. One of them was actually provided to us by uh, John Warden, and I did everybody get a copy of that. John Warden or Patricia Warden? Which one? Patricia Warden. Uh, one's by Patricia, and maybe one's by John. I don't know. I, I'm not looking at the document right now. Yeah, but uh, so that that is one, and, uh, and other articles are proposed by Barbara Thornton. You've asked Barbara and Steve to return this evening to talk more mm -hmm. about their proposed yeah, articles. I'm not sure. And then. Is there anything else in that packet? No. No. So are there, maybe there are other articles that folks would like to discuss further. But these are the ones that we are aware of. And of course, the warrant article deadline is Friday. So I think it's safe to say that at a meeting in February, we will discuss this again. I can't promise that it will be Monday, February okay. 3rd. So we don't have to meeting. do anything with this. No, this is just for your information. Okay. At this point in time. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So, uh, consideration and move forward. And Barbara, if you'd like to come up and walk us through sure. your articles. Stand here. Along with the crew. Yes. Wait Just, uh, use the, the microphone. Use the microphone. Uh -huh. I'm sorry? What the judgment are we on? We are on the discussion of town meeting uh, amendments. It's only by Warren the article. Number four? We're open four. We're not on number four. Number three. Yeah. Three. So the only discussion right now is among yourselves. That's correct. No, I ask because the, the documents posted only three, four, three of them. The other articles that uh, this gentleman is referencing are actually as part of the correspondence received. And if there's any other new information that will be provided and submitted as correspondence to this board, okay. we will provide those additionally. Okay. Thanks, Barbara, for the turn out to be yes, Thank you very much. Last time I was here, you asked me to yes. come back and answer some questions. And before I answer, your questions, I thought, because it's very late, so I, but I'd like to go quickly through telling you, again, just a quick review of, of the three uh, proposals that are that I'm bringing to you today. Uh, I feel like I need to hold this with my teeth and still talk. This is complicated. Yeah, I got my glasses on. Can you pull that? Okay, so the first. The first one is accessory dwelling units. The second one is uh, affordable housing on non-conforming parcels. And the third one is a design competition. That's my shorthand for referring to these. Uh, to, to be brief, the first one, accessory dwelling units, is an article to propose the adoption of accessory dwelling units. It is not the same as the uh, one that, that was uh, heard by town meeting last year. I started out making it, it very uh, general with a, with a purpose, to, to clarify the intent, and then to take from, there's over 100 municipalities in Massachusetts that have accessory dwelling unit legislation on their books, and I was going to take, I took pieces of that and, and pulled together the detail of what a, uh, a bill might look like, or what a warrant might look like. Uh, I met with uh, Doug Heim, he said, no, this is not the way you should do it. Uh, so, so we spent about an hour, I uh, spent about an hour with Doug Heim, and then he would ask me uh, to spend some time with 
the uh, building inspector. I spent about an hour with the building inspector. And I thought, as long as I'm on a roll, the building inspector said, I hope you're going to talk to the fire chief. So mm -hmm. I spent about an hour with the fire chief. I've also spent time on the phone with, uh, with people who are at the state level working with building codes and, and have a lot of phone calls in that they take longer than town people do to return calls. So I am still waiting for their calls back in, in some cases where I haven't had a chance to get back to them and close the loop. But what I, what I have done is I've, I've put together a very short uh, uh, article and, and hope that you all understand the purpose. But just in case you don't, there's really three parts. Uh, to make available reasonable priced housing opportunities for people who need uh, housing of a type or a price not currently available to them. And uh, make offer homeowners with larger homes and available space who are overhoused that have limited incomes particularly those who have incomes that have been hit hard by increases in property tax, an opportunity to monetize that space in order to continue to live in their homes, and three, create a space in their homes to care for elderly or disabled family members or others, or to be cared, and perhaps to be cared for in return as they age. Uh, so those are the, those are the, sort of motivations behind this. The format of this is the short proposal following the guidelines that, that Doug Heim gave me, uh, referencing specific warrant articles that I think need to be changed. I mean, not warrant articles, I'm sorry. Zoning bylaws mm -hmm. that need to be changed. So you'll see four zoning bylaws uh, referenced here. You may have different feelings about what needs to be changed. Uh, and that's it for the accessory development so Then a long piece of notes. That's a format I've used for all three of these. Uh, there's, a, there's the actual file warrant article that I'm suggesting, and then there's, a, in this case, pages of notes. And I can uh, talk more in detail about what I learned maybe from the other conversations. <coughs> Moving on to the next one, affordable housing on non-conforming parcels. This was an idea that, that was not mine, um, but I thought it was a great idea. Uh, there are parcels, the standard parcel requirement is 6,000 6, square feet uh, to build a residential unit and, in uh, Arlington. This would reduce that on a condition, and I love uh, Mr. Benson's term, a quid pro quo. This is a quid pro quo for getting more affordable housing in Arlington. It is essentially saying, we will let you build on that site that is too small to officially build on under today's bylaws, but or what we will require you to do is to make whatever you build, whatever residential unit you build on that site perfectly affordable. So that, and, and it stipulates some of the conditions for how that will be done. Third is uh, the design competition. I think that uh, somebody said it earlier today that, that they are, we don't attract enough different kinds of developers and different kinds of developer ideas here. I think it was one of the, the first conversations about the hotel. Uh, this is to try and get Arlington on the landscape of really good developers and creative architects who, who can come in and say, we understand you have an affordable housing problem. We deal with, we build affordable housing. We are reasonable. We are transparent in our procedures. We want to build for a, a, a middle income a population with a range of incomes uh, in Arlington. And this is a, and uh, Doug Hine had me change this from an article to a resolution. So it should officially come across as a resolution. Any, any, ask me anything. On the last, what was it was called resolution? Yeah. Uh, here, are we asking for funding to support a competition? I, I don't know, I don't know what the ask is. Because anybody uh, could do a competition and just put it out well, there. Well, no, the, the resolution would be you would have you would have to do something 
very specific. I'll tell you what you have to do. What I think you would have to do. <laughs> I think you would have to say, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to advertise. We're going to get some money to advertise. But mainly what you're going to have to agree on is what you're going to want, what, what the terms, it's like a, a writing a proposal, an RFP, request for proposals. You're going to have to write the terms for the request for proposals. So you're getting a proposal. I'm suggesting that it be 50 to 200 residential units per project, that it be 25 units of a percent units affordable according to regional standards, uh, building to LE, lead or net zero requirements, 75 to 100 percent one bedroom units, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of thing, that's what you'll have to do. The money should come from the town. Uh, but they don't have, if they don't give the money, this is a resolution. It's just saying, town meeting voted that this is a good idea. Go forth and make it happen. Make it so. Let me, let me be able to be clear enough. Uh -huh. um, so we, are we asking the town to give us a parcel of land so that someone can do this uh, competition? Or is it a, is a, a fictitious piece of land that someone wants to do because I, I don't see I don't see how a developer or a contractor or an architect would want to invest the time and money in doing something like that and not have something come of it. It references uh, the Broadway corridor and it would require the uh, planning department and the ARB in the town to say this is a parcel and it could be a parcel of, of, of you know a, a block for a very few number of units, or it could be parcel of, of a few blocks uh, of more units. And we are going to set aside the normal standards for zoning if you do this in this, if you provide these conditions, if you meet this, this FAR, if you meet these building standards, if you meet these affordability requirements and these design conditions, show us what you've got and we're going to give you we're going to waive, we're going to create an island of no current zoning. We're going to have special zoning for that. It's a condition of its time from it. It's sort of a, another quid pro quo. We have to go back to town meeting. We have to go back to town meeting. Yes. Yeah. I, I, what you suggested is what uh, I've seen in the past is a PUD, where it's something where there is. There's an area set aside where um, the government, the city, or town is encouraging that kind of development in that area. I, 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 I was advised by Doug Kine not to call it a PUD. Okay. Um, it's and to leave it as this is a resolution that the town begin working on on this process, which doesn't mean that you need to get the money right away or that the town meeting is voting for the money. The town meeting is voting, would be voting, to ask the appropriate town officials to get together and, and reach some uh, decision about how big a parcel, under what conditions, what is the quid pro quo. So I think, <clears throat> I think this is probably more of a long term project. Given yeah, it might happen this April and then it might well, I think, come I back think what again the following. What would happen, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I can, I can simplify it. Uh, this goes to town meeting and it's a direction by town meeting the appropriate boards to say, go ahead and figure this out. Yeah. Figure out how to do this. Come back in a year with zoning proposals, locations, criteria, recommendations for how this works. Show us what you have. Show us your work in a year or two. Uh, I was thinking six months. But. <laughs> <laughs> but we're bound by town meeting okay. time. So um, it might have to be, it might be six months if there's a special town meeting. It would have to be a year if it were but what, what, what could come of this is kind of an interesting thought exercise. Um, I don't want to dig into the details of the weeds tonight. I, I think we all want to think about it a little bit more. But big picture conceptually, I think it's, it's worth exploring further as to what might come of it. Um, but we'll have to say, it, 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 it's, it, the fact that, that it's a resolution means that it's essentially non binding mm -hmm. And if it dies, <clears throat> somewhere in committee, so to speak, and so be it. But town meeting has said, go do this, uh, <clears throat> figure this, this issue out. Uh, it could be a good way to somewhere down the line 
add the kind of projects that are not currently buildable because of lot size and uh, other restrictions. So. And, and it also is a, a marketing tool for you to attract um, developers that are more inclined to do, that are more mission driven than developers, developers who are, and architects who are used to working together to create good uh, projects from a public interest perspective. Yeah. Okay, great. Any, any questions on the I, uh, I, I have a question, well, more of a question or concern about the allowing affordable housing on non-conforming lots. I wondered if you talked to the town council about whether that's consistent with the state zoning. Yes. Code. Yes, and he I said did. yes. And, well, he, I, I don't. You know, I've got someplace in here, I've got my notes about <coughs> We spent more time when we talked about the uh, ADU, and then he gave me specific language or specific <coughs> directions for that. And I sent him this last week, but he's, as you might imagine, up to his eyeballs, so he hasn't written back. But there, there wasn't any anything that I found that he objected to uh, with the state zone. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about it more. <laughs> it is being, <coughs> it, it would be clarified as part of this process. He hasn't gotten to that particular step. He's reviewed as yeah. much we're as not, we're not, point. we're not voting on Barbara's. I know, I just wondered if she had so. had that yeah. conversation. Yeah. I, think, I think that's a good conversation to have. So yeah. Mr. Water. Chairman, uh, Barbara and I actually cooperated a bit on um, one of these articles, and I wonder if I would be allowed to make some comments on them at this time. Briefly. Okay. That's a yes. It's the uh, affordable housing on non-conforming parcels. Um, I actually wrote some of the language that appears here. Um, I think it's a uh, it's a starting of a good idea, but I'm a little shocked at how it's been changed, and I don't know if Barbara understands the implications. Uh, first change is permitted in all zoning do districts allowing residential use. The version that we're working on limited it to R0, R1, and R2. By saying all districts allowing residential use, that opens it up to just about every zoning district in town other than industrial, because you can build on commercial okay. lots. The okay. other thing that I object to very strongly is that when it was first presented three weeks ago, it was only to be on those lots which have never been developed and are not conforming. Not lots that are, have been developed and perhaps subdivided since then or something. It was only to be on those small parcels of previously undeveloped land. And I, any support I had for this goes away if those two things All right, are made let's, in there. Let's, why don't you two have that discussion? I, I, no, I, no. Barbara. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with this recommendation because okay. I didn't realize that there was an issue. I, I don't want to get into the shadow yeah. match. No, I'll make, I'll make a change on that. No, no shadow match. We've had a very cordial conversation about it. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. So let's, okay. let's move on. Um, okay, we'll have you back. Any other questions for Barbara? Assuming that Steve. Yes. Go on. Uh, so the um, the article I submitted was uh, basically based on the memo uh, I sent to the board uh, discussing the you know, there are perhaps better better terms than open space, usable open space, and landscape open space, uh, as they appear in our, our, in our zoning laws. So we have, I mean, the terms open space appear uh, in two different ways, and they're used in two different contexts. One is in how they refer to the open space district. The other is to open space as the dimensional requirement for yards. Um, the actual language of the article that I proposed, if uh, if I can try to try to wing it off the top of my head, was to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw of the town of Arlington by reading the terms open space, open space landscaped, and open space usable as appearing in section two definitions, or take any other action here too. So it's basically just I, what I want to do is 
I've seen a lot of a lot of people have misconceptions about what open space as a demand, as a yard regulation means, and some of some of them happened. Some of them came up tonight. Um, so I, I would like to see if we can find better words to fit the definitions. Um, the article was did not make any specific recommendations. I do have some preferences, but I wanted to, um, you know, leave room for the board's input. Okay. But the terms are used not only in the definitions, but throughout. And I'm just afraid that if your warrant article limits it just to the definitions, it may be too narrow. Well, the, it's renaming the terms, the I know, ter but renaming defined terms. But I, I do think if you change the definition, if you change the term, you have to change it everywhere. I think what right. I, I think I, I, I see where Gene's going with this, and I don't. I, I agree with where you're going with this. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't limit it just to changing the definitions in articles. So okay. I think you might want to make sure that I, all I, of those definitions throughout the, the entire zone by large are edited appropriately to match the definition. Or at least addressed. Okay. There's, um, yeah, I had, I had uh, reviewed the town language with town council uh, and explained my intent was that we not change the definitions themselves, just the terms that are defined. Um, and he, he was okay with, he was okay with that, but we'll, we'll see, I guess we will see whether or not I've made the, the classic amateur's error. I mean, I, I appreciate the, that you're trying to bring some clarity to something that we've repeatedly seen <laughs> confusing people. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I'm, I, I just think we need to be very careful to do that in a way that doesn't have any unintended consequences. I, I agree with you completely. Okay. Thank you. Right, I'm going to table the uh, discussion. <coughs> I would just note on that the select board did take it up and they provided a couple of amendments okay. and they voted on it. So they have already discussed it and talked about it. I can share that with you, however, at the next meeting. Let's do that. Let's do that next, take it from next Monday night. Right. Yeah, especially if they have comments. We can we can do that and respond. Uh, since we'll be here next Monday night, so I'll table that agenda item February third and the next agenda is, is open. Is open for so if there are any members of the public that wish to speak, uh, no action is going to be taken, but go ahead, Mr. Loretta. All right, Mr. Chairman, just a, just a couple comments. I didn't uh, realize that you were looking for citizen articles in that last agenda. I, uh, I'll tell you there are a few more coming soon as before. I'll just be very clear about that. Just, I that? just want to clarify, we weren't looking for them. John Borden submitted to my office a document that I have circulated to this board, and this board specifically asked Ms. Thornton and Mr. Revelak to return this evening, which they did. There were no other articles talked about for the last agenda. No, they, didn't come back. they did at their last meeting, but there was not some sort of open call provided broadly necessarily, but they asked them both at the last meeting to provide further elaboration. So I'm just clarifying that's the reason for that particular. As I said, you'll be getting more zoning articles. I won't throw anything out. I'd just like to offer a couple of comments on what they presented. Um, particularly this one on the other side, lot size. We already have a state law called 40B that has a mechanism for doing exactly what they're proposing. I can't imagine why we do that at the town level. We can already do it at the state law. And that requires the new ZBA approval to do exactly what they're proposing. <laughs> that, that is super bizarre. Um, and then to uh, Mr. Rebelak's um, article, if I understood him right, he is opening up the possibility of changing the definition of uh, usable and landscape open space in any way possible based on the language of the one article he just talked about putting forward. Um, I think that's extremely dangerous and uh, it could certainly be abused by town meeting members if that indeed is the language as he just described it. And finally, to the accessory dwelling unit article, um, I realize it may not be exactly the same as what was proposed last year, but it sure sounds an awful lot like it. And I'm presuming at this point it was just going to a citizen's article that comes in all. <coughs> I think previously your board said it would only be you know, doing sort of minor corrections this time. I'm guessing that that is, or suggesting that should be the case. Um, of course, you know, once they're submitted by citizens, you Support them or not during the one trial, or after the one trial, okay. Thank you. Okay, I got 
or something in that way, please. Go ahead. The only way that the ADU article can come back is if it is indeed substantively Jenny, different than the was, Yeah, sorry. Okay. The only way that that warrant article can come back is if it is indeed substantively different than the one that was voted on at the last town meeting because that one did fail as a result of its vote at town meeting. And so the only way to, one, you would need to support it to bring it back, but two, the only way to support that is that it's substantively different. So we would, of course, you know, if it is filed, we would need to review that and ensure that it is indeed substantively different than what was filed and voted on previously because of the stay that occurs after something has been rejected at town meeting. Mr. Chairman, I, I think that's not quite correct. If your board supports it, you can put a paragraph that's identical to the one that you submitted previously. Okay, Key let's, thing move, let's, your let's, let's move on. Thank you, Ms. Lurie. Yes, <clears throat> I'd like to request that, I know you have a lot to do, but that the agenda be made clearer because I know a number of people who would have liked to come to the beginning discussion about several of these articles, ADUs, um, the contest, and so forth, that really feel strongly, and they would have come. I had no idea when I looked at the agenda that this would be brought up tonight or that Ms. Warden would be asked to come and uh, give more explanation, and they would like to be here. So I would like to make that request. Thank you. Um, I am very concerned about this term overhouse. Uh, it says here these are often all these people are overhoused in homes and three or more bedrooms. We have no data to show that. Is this about Ms. Thornton's article? Yes. That's not a board article for right now, so I suggest you take it out of time. You can you can ask Ms. Thornton. The board's not proposing that, so we can't take any action on it yet. If it moves forward, well, it's part of the general can. discussion. No, 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 that's that's fine. I'm just telling you that the, the appropriate discussion to have is with Barbara. Well, so I do appreciate your input, but that's oh, I certainly work on with Barbara. Open discussion that we could discuss. And you are, and I've given you that opportunity. But let's move on instead of arguing. I thank you, and I'm telling you, I understand your concern. Have that conversation with Ms. Thorne before she presents her article and submits it on Friday. So we have to have private. No, it's not, it's not an AR, I'm telling you, it's not an ARB article. It's a Barbara Thornton article. It's a citizen-supported article. A concern about the language that's being proposed in there should be brought up with Ms. Thornton before she submits that Warren article on Friday. Joanne, you asked me for it weeks ago when I sent it to you. We can't tell, we can't tell her what to do. Okay. <laughs> but you, you can have a conversation with her and have that clarified. What was the purpose of her speaking tonight? She, she came to us several weeks ago, said, here's what I'm thinking about doing. I said, come back, let us know your progress on the 27th. That's all, that's all that happened. Okay. So, it's a citizen, so it's a citizen promoter article. I'm having a discussion article. with you, but not with us. I, I'm sorry. The purpose was for her to have a discussion with you, but not with us. Yes. Yeah. It's her article. It's not an ARB article. It's a Barbara Thornton article. If you have a question as to the clarification of her article, take it up with her. I know you've worked with her on other things. I'm happy to let to off, to, I'm happy to off, to offer you the time to speak, but we're getting into the weeds here about what's appropriate and what isn't in the form. What you have is a question for Ms. Thornton, not for the ARB. There'll be public discussions on this so, if it moves forward. So people can present things, but we can't discuss them until they're final. So you're asking the question. I'm telling you how to get the answer that you want. Joanne, I'm happy to talk to you about it. You're being obtuse, and let's move on. Does anyone else have a question? can have a conversation with Ms. Thornton. I'm sure she'll be happy to answer the question. I can't answer that question for you. Thank you. And does anyone else have a question, comment, concern? Can we move forward on this thing? Yes, Mr. Lurie, again. Please, um, relate to this warrant article on um, using parking. And I understand it was, it was prompted by this pub in Arlington Heights. Did your board already grant a special permit before the variance? It's conditional on variance. I mean, my, my experience is it's been the other way, where they, they get the variance first and then come to the mm. come, come okay. okay. Take up the ZBA. Anyone else? Seeing now, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 <coughs>